see it, it's on check again. Yeah, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's like, it was like the last two. Yeah, they are there on a day. No, no, you don't need it. No, I mean, whatever. Yeah, no, 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 Better for the thing. Oh, I know. That's what they're like. I don't understand. But yeah. apparently, yeah. they were like, yeah. yeah. I think they still have like a large guy around. Yeah. 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 They don't have to give someone. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. All right. For my turn. Yeah. 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 It's like, oh, uh, you were really. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so there you go. Wow. I, I, they're kind of more, uh, I have more like follow questions to that. You just threw something, you know, like everyone has. <laughs> this is the official AMWD belt. <laughs> So everybody, welcome to the uh, dying atmosphere, whole atmosphere, and uh, chemistry climate winter working group meetings, um, briefing before we get going. First of all, uh, NCA UCAS code of, code of conduct, uh, share the air, listen, understand, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the second thing. Uh, I'm not wearing a mic meeting that there are mics in the ceiling here that are picking up. So it picks up on everything. So if you're chatting, it's going to be hard for the people online to hear what the speaker is saying. Um, and then thirdly, uh, I'm not with your Bachmeister. <laughs> He's been standing up here for the past uh, six years. <laughs> so I'd like to just you know, jointly just acknowledge uh, Julio's leadership and hard work for the MWG bringing CAM6 to fruition and bringing 7, 95% to fruition. I'm just here finishing up the last uh, the last 5%. So uh, let's give me a big hand for that. During uh, last um, MWG <laughs> session, this was in the summer during the CSM workshop, uh, Julio showed the slide where he was anticipating his future life not being <laughs> WG co chair. Um, sitting there with his drink at the pool. <laughs> and on the right is me in the coal mine uh, chopping away. So I just want to make sure that that glass uh, remains full. You know, here is something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the actual rules are. <laughs> All right. So we're going to start with the uh, three overview talks, uh, one for each uh, working group, respectively. Um, and we're going to have joint sessions today and tomorrow, and then on Wednesday, we're going to break into the different working groups. Um, I'm the, now the internal co-chair. Uh, we have two external co-chairs, Kevin Reed from Stony Brook and Puri Van from PNL. Unfortunately, neither of them are able to be here in person, but they are uh, listening in. 
Uh, and then also, uh, well, I check in with them like on a monthly basis. So I'd like to just thank them for all the input they're providing to help uh, move uh, Camp 7 forward. And then also Cecile Hanna is our stable force who does all our simulations, a lot of diagnostics and so on. And you're the only one who doesn't rotate up. So <laughs> stable, stable ambulance. <laughs> 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 All right, so um, before I go on to talk about CAN 7, I would like to talk briefly about uh, a new code base, CAN SEMA. There has been talks about this at the previous meetings. I'm not going to go over that, but more what uh, effects this will have on the quote unquote factory floor. So for users of CAM and for developers of CAM, I'll go into the CAN 7 timeline. Um, uh, Kevin and Huri have been asked to have presentation on each new thing going into CAM 7. So I'll briefly introduce that and then talk a little bit about our ongoing CSM3 coupled model um, as our event. So why are we doing CAM SEMA? There, there are many reasons uh, for it. Uh, one reason here from the CAM perspective is what I call physics scheme clarification and flexibility. So currently when you're running CAM 4, 5, 6, or 7, it's all run from the same uh, module, loosely speaking. So that means that the logic in the code uh, can be pretty uh, complicated at, at times. We use CAM 4, do this, that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that was kind of also illustrated uh, when we uh, chose to uh, Move where we're calling our boundary layer scheme club to before the coupler instead of after the coupler. And again, that took many months to do and it was quite narrow curl. So, kind of showing that the system is a little fragile in that sense. And to address this issues, uh, this issue and others, you know, a group of software engineers from many institutions recommended to uh, create this. Um, System called the Community Elkana Community Physics Package (CCPP). Jesse talked about this a year ago. The link to his presentation is right there. Uh, but loosely speaking, you now we're wrapping our parameterizations in this framework, and we make it very explicit and clear what goes in and out of the parameterization. We create dictionaries to describe what the variables are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> Uh, thereby making the physics schemes more portable. I look, would like to point out, please remember, this is just the physics package. So this will always sit in a host model. And in this case, it will sit inside of, uh, of CAM. So the host model will always be responsible for adding whatever comes from physics to the model state. Same way the die core is not sitting in the CCP, but sitting in the host model. We're in the process of, of porting parameterizations right now. Um, so we effectively have two code bases, the CAM SEMA and then the CAM development. So CAM development is the one we're currently working in for developing 3SN 3.0. But once we import a parameterization, we use the same code in both code bases. So we don't have duplication. When we add, uh, we're pretty close to uh, done being done porting uh, CSM simple physics uh, packages to the CCPP. Uh, we're scheduled to finish uh, CAM 7 physics porting by the end of FY25. Uh, and sometime around then or a little later, we'll also have full physics and aerosol capability in the CCPP. Um, Alice Simpson and, 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 and Julio and I and others wrote a proposal to make sure CAM 4, 5, and 6 would also be supported in this new framework. I added an ish there because we're not going to reproduce all physics uh, packages. And also, like some uh, parameterization we're not going to port. So we're not going to port the old CAM RT radiation package. We're going to use the, the new RRT and GP for that. OK, so the main point I would like to uh, to make here is that for CAM or for CSM 3.0, if it is released on schedule, then we will be using our old code base in that release. And then when CAM SEMA is ready to do the task of CAM development, 
Um, then we will move to the new code base. So in some future version of CSM, we will move to this CAM CMA code base that we found with CDSM. So the important point here is um, for the developers and users is I mean, what is not ported to CAM CMA won't be supported long term and be available there. Before you panic, <laughs> as I said, we're reporting CAM 456. Seven, there will be a chemistry version, Wacom, Wacom X, et cetera, in there. If you are using some configuration that, that's not on the list to be ported, please be aware that, we, that our policy is that whatever we release, we do support for, for five years after the after. So enough about CAM SEMA. Um, back to uh, CAM 7 and CSM 3. This is a slide from uh, our new chief scientist, Dave Lawrence, on um, basically working backwards from IPCC timelines on when we need to have a code base ready. And if you do work that backwards, then we should have a code freeze sometime uh, this summer. In terms of model development, that's pretty much tomorrow. <laughs> and what's new in CAM uh, 7? So, uh, each of these arrows I'm going to show in the next two slides, there will be a presentation covering each of them. Um, so first of all, as, as many of you are aware, we um, increased the vertical resolution in the boundary layer, and at the same time, we raised the model top from uh, 42 kilometers up to about 80 uh, kilometers. So that's a big change. We have not changed the resolution significantly in CAM for a very long time, like CAM 4, 5, 6 years ago. 26, 30, and 32 levels in the verticals. So this is a big change. We have uh, concepts, meaning that you can run this configuration out of the box. So for the 80 kilometer top, it's called FMT, where M is stand, or MT stands for mid top. Uh, and then we're still keeping a low top version available because we do a lot of tropospheric physics uh, forcing, so to save our computer time, we, we run that version a lot. So here we also uh, unified certain things. Uh, for example, we now have simplified chemistry, radiated reactive CO2 that vectored around, for example, it used to be just Wacom, now that's done in this modeling system. Um, we also have a unified uh, treatment of gravity waves now, except for the top boundary condition. That's a big change moving forward. Uh, also, we haven't changed the die core. Camp 456. So this we're now moving to a more modern die core, so the finite volume to the spectral element die core. I will talk about what the changes were there. Uh, MG Microphysics has moved into its own uh, repos repository called Pumas, and I have lots of uh, science changes associated with that. Uh, Andrew Gettleman gave a talk at last AMWG about the new things going in. There's a link to this presentation right there. Uh, we've also updated our club code, um, so we're using prognostic momentum transport, which we did not in CAM 6. And there are um, two versions of club that we are exploring. So there's the L scale version, which is CAM 6 light, but then there's also a, a, a new version called TAUS. So we have the L scale and the, the TAUS version of club. Um, in order to meet the deadline, um, we kind of want to take a decision on whether to use the L scale or Tower's code around this time. And we'll have presentations on both these configurations in a little bit. We've adopted a uh, convective, uh, convective gustiness. Um, Mike will talk about that. Um, as we pointed out, uh, the summer we have some pretty severe stratospheric wind uh, biases. Gravity wave changes to the kind of gravity wave conversation to address that. That's work in progress. Uh, we have a new uh, radiation code base called RRTMGP that Brian Medeiros will talk about. Um, and then we've also uh, made a lot of changes on the CAM side to uh, improve the coupling between MOM6 and CAM7, so in particular, passing enthalpy fluxes. The work is not done or fully evaluated yet. So hence the, the coloring here where there uh, may be errors and then there's stuff that's, that's scientifically approved and almost in the code base. So as I said, each of these errors that's, that you're gonna hear about this um, 
afternoon after the other overview talks. All righty, so a um, couple of developments. So we always start out in terms of a couple model evaluation to try and get a, a stable um, pre-industrial control running. Uh, the first bar to meet is that we're in uh, top of atmosphere uh, balance. Um, so we look at plots like this that's shown over here. So the globally average uh, top of atmosphere radiative balance within different model <laughs> configurations. We would like to be that to have that close to zero as possible. And then due to us being traumatized by CSM2 and the lab C freezing, this is a standard plot too, where we look at the lab C ice fraction as well. So we have an old reference simulation. It's basically the first time we assembled CAM7 in terms of vertical levels and physics reordering. So that's the 26G gray lines there. And then there are the two versions or two tracks we're exploring now with Club L scale, Tau, so that's blue and red uh, respectively. And you see in terms of uh, the top of atmosphere balance, uh, and, and not freezing over, at least for this time period here, both of them look good. And Adam Harrington, and sorry, Ben, I forgot to put you on here as well, but they will both talk more about these configurations. So uh, I asked uh, Adam Phillips in, in the, the climate analysis section if he could run his, his extensive diagnostic suite on these two tracks. Uh, and ask him, you know, what's the best thing you're seeing and what's what's the worst thing you're seeing, in your opinion, and consulted with Clara uh, Dessa, I think Isla as well. Uh, so what you're seeing here is an Inu 3-4 index. This is the, the standard in devi deviation by month on the, on the left-hand side here. Uh, so on both of these plots here, these uh, orange lines here, that is the club L configuration uh, of CAM7. And these boxes up here, they uh, they represent the spread in our CESM2 PI controlled, uh, dividing the simulation up to a yeah, 60 year period. So that's basically the spread of that. We see we're way below <clears throat> CESM2 in terms of the standard deviation for this index. And then down here, you see um, the uh, orange uh, lines are the same as before, but now we're comparing to, to observations. I'm using Adam Phillips for Wording here, the match between club L scale configuration observation seen in the bottom panel is likely the best I've ever seen from a CESM run. Disclaimer, this run is only 60 years, which is very short for doing this kind of analysis. And on the right hand side, I want to go into detail. So this is somewhat the same story, but here in terms of a, a frequency analysis. Now to the bad parts. Um, so if you look at homola diagrams with, with time increasing upwards here, we have CSM2 on the upper left, and then observations below, the same on the right-hand side here, and then club L scale on the, the upper right of each of these panels, and then club tau. Is, um, and, and apparently when Clara Dessa saw this, she, she was like, whoa, when she saw this. So the La Nina is not really transitioning to La Nina, these new uh, configurations. So and they termed that as worrisome. And as mentioned, uh, we're keeping a close eye on the Labrador sea freeze. And we've had uh, many, many simulations not freeze over. Um, they haven't been multiple hundreds of years, but more often than not, it's not freezing over. Um, and some months ago, we, we had a really we had a promising simulation called 64. That's when we had just adopted the Gustinus uh, parameterization, which really helped uh, the MGO in our simulation. And that's why you see in the black line, and then the thing freezes over. Um, so we did some uh, perturbation experiments here, um, basically going back to year 43 or 33, um, and then just perturbing a run through uh, one of the Turing parameters called plus gamma. Just perturbing that uh, a little bit, so it's beyond random, uh, beyond round of changes, but again, it's the perturbation. And when we did all these runs, you know, two out of the seven 
froze over. So we haven't been able to tie this to any particular uh, physics change. And this simulation here again shows that if you change uh, your perturbative solution, you can end up not uh, freezing over. And that's all I have. I think I'm 20 minutes in. So we'll do questions uh, after the overview talks. So please hold your breath. That's the wrong no, that's okay. oh, sorry. Uh, so, so, thanks, uh, so I will present the overview for the whole atmosphere uh, working group. Uh, so a few kind of change to start since uh, we last report in mean, uh, the June uh, CSM workshop. So after a while with no uh, liaison, after Mike Mills left, now uh, Mei Zhang uh, from ACOM has taken over uh, duties as a science uh, liaison for the, the whole atmosphere working group. So it's good to have uh, her help in that regard. Uh, so I will present uh, the results here, but uh, many thanks to everyone who has contributed uh, from the WACAM and, and WACAM X side in terms of uh, the developments. So in terms of primary uh, developments, I'll split into two parts. Uh, first, I'll talk a bit about the, the what has been done with Markham and then some on uh, Markham X. And uh, similar to, to what Peter uh, just showed, a lot of the uh, topics will be discussed in more detail uh, later today or tomorrow. And, and where that's the case, I'll point that out so that you can just uh, know why I'm just skipping over them uh, quickly. So for Wacom, uh, kind of the main thing that, that has been done is we transitioned uh, more recent development to the latest uh, CAM development physics. Uh, prior to the last working group meeting, everything was still using CAM6 physics. Uh, so this was a big change and then also changed to the latest uh, development tag uh, for the for the Wacom development. I will discuss uh, in more detail, uh, there was a lot of problems related to model stability in WACO, uh, and these have been mostly addressed, uh, we think, uh, so far. And I'll show some of these results, but the main changes here were uh, in incorporating the HP diffusion. Uh, and then Peter, uh, I think he'll discuss later uh, today to some degree the, the stability issue. Uh, but he made some updates to a C dynamical core uh, to help stabilize the model. And both of these uh, together really improve the model throughput uh, without accounting for the, the stability issues. The model was very expensive and, and very slow, which made it uh, difficult to work with. Uh, and we uh, completed some baseline uh, simulations that kind of incorporating these, these above changes uh, that provide a baseline for our, our future evaluation and the future tuning. And then uh, Doug and others have been working on this inline photolysis and heating, uh, he'll talk about that more uh, tomorrow. And for Wacom X, uh, main uh, developments that will go into new version are extension of the, the SC dynamical core into the thermosphere. Uh, Hanley will talk about that more tomorrow. And then we've done some preliminary tasks with a new configuration uh, that would use the CAM development physics and then follow the same uh, level structure as CAM and Wacom and then extend into the thermosphere. And I've completed some long-term uh, historical and projection simulation for space climate. So continue. <laughs> <laughs> I think we we'll have to keep sharing. Uh, okay. So in terms of this issue with stability, uh, this is a plot from Peter, uh, basically showing what the instability problem was that we were getting at Wacom. And this is the, the maximum and minimum uh, wind speed near the model top. Uh, so you can see as the model sort of goes along, you get these periodic kind of jumps in the wind speed to, to very high values. Uh, and if it gets, these get too large, then the model essentially cr will crash. Um, and they're not, they weren't occurring all the time, but it was such that you had to run with a very sort of short time step and then that was slowing things down. And then periodically the model would crash and 
have to be restarted. So this was really you know, increasing the cost and slowing the throughput. Um, so the solution to that, I think, uh, that Peter uh, had come up with and now is being used is essentially a deeper uh, sponge layer uh, with damping in the top few model levels and then a, a fourth order divergence damping that extends down about 20 mm -hmm. uh, layers to around 80 kilometers. And once these are incorporated into the model, this really significantly improve uh, the model stability. And then uh, because of the model was more stable, we can run with a, a lower time, uh, dynamical time step and then get better uh, model performance. So in terms of computational costs now, uh, accounting for this, the, the two degree model uh, cost is about uh, 4,500 uh, hours per simulated year. And we get throughput about eight hours uh, or eight years per day. And at one degree, it is about 25,000 uh, core hours uh, per year. And we get about five uh, simulated years per day. And these are all F case with uh, uh, reduced chemistry, the middle atmosphere chemistry. And as I note here on the bottom, if we don't address uh, these issues with model stability, the cost was about double uh, for the one degree and throughput was about one year per day. Uh, so really, these, uh, what was done to address stability was just quite crucial to have a model that is kind of computationally usable for running any sort of long-term simulations and, and future tuning. So it is good that uh, that seems to be addressed. So after accounting for these, I'll show some of the, the tuning results uh, that we have for the current uh, sort of best uh, baseline case that we have. And all of these will be compared against the, uh, what I'll call tag 93. And these are essentially the best tuned version that Nick Davis had developed uh, before he left NCAR in uh, the summer. Uh, so he had spent a lot of time sort of getting a tuned up version. Uh, so we're using that as a kind of a reference as we move forward to incorporating the new physics uh, and these other changes. So here is a zonal mean, uh, zonal wind for uh, DJF. Uh, so here is Nick's case on the upper left and then upper right, the latest uh, Wacom run. Uh, and then these are differences with respect to mirror. And you can see, generally speaking, though, there are some differences. The, the biases are similar to what we had in this sort of previous best case. Uh, and here's looking at uh, June, July, August. Uh, again, same format. Uh, and you can see on the bottom, the new version seems to be consistent for the most part with what uh, Nick had uh, in his, his sort of previous tuned version. One caveat to these are that these aren't necessarily apples to apples comparisons. A lot of the time change, time periods are different and the length of the two runs are different. So you know, the difference between what he was getting and what we are getting, you might not say are you know, true statistically significant uh, changes. And uh, Rolando and others have also been looking at the QBO. Uh, and here is a plot of the time series uh, for this previous uh, tag 93 version. Uh, and these are uh, zonal winds at the equator uh, on the left and then amplitude and period uh, QBO on the right. Uh, so this is again, the top is the tag 93. And then the middle is our, our latest version. And then bottom is mirror two. And you can see in the, the new version, uh, so here the black line is the amplitude from uh, mirror two, and then the blue is from the, the different runs. And uh, in Nick's case, the amplitude was reasonably uh, matching, maybe a little bit weak, uh, lower down, but now in the new version, it's quite weak. So we still have some sort of work to do in terms of tuning uh, the QBO uh, to get better uh, agreement. And one uh, sort of bigger uh, issue seems to be in the southern hemisphere uh, polar cap temperature. This is a, this plot here is just showing the difference. So it's the annual cycle. Uh, the difference with respect to Mira on the left is this previous uh, kind of best tuned version, and then on the right is the latest runs that we have done. And there's this very large uh, cold bias that appeared, um, and this seemed to come about when we switched to the CAM uh, development physics from the CAM six physics uh, between these two. Uh, so this is still something that, that we will need to, to address going forward. And then last, uh, Doug will talk about this in much more detail uh, tomorrow morning, 
uh, but he has been working on incorporating the inline uh, photolysis and heating using TUVX. And here are some of his initial results uh, showing uh, very good agreement when he runs Wacom uh, with it with either the new approach uh, compared to using a lookup table. Uh, and you can see here is uh, kind of a close agreement uh, between the two. And then on the right is the heating rate uh, using the lookup table approach versus the new sort of inline approach. And you can see there's quite good agreement between the two. And Doug will have, I think, a lot more to say about this uh, tomorrow morning. And so moving on to the developments for the uh, Wacom X, uh, which extends into the thermosphere. Uh, main changes have been adoption of the spectral element dynamical core and extending it into the thermosphere. And this requires several additional change, uh, including species dependent dynamical core, uh, incorporating horizontal um, viscosity and diffusion, and then a regridding uh, between the, the irregular physics mesh and then a geomagnetic grid, which we need to use for the ionospheric calculations. And Hanley will discuss uh, a lot of these changes in more detail uh, tomorrow morning. And in terms of configurations, uh, we've run with this, uh, both with the CAM6 physics, and also we've run recent tests with the CAM development physics uh, using the uh, two degree version. Uh, I won't show the, the latest runs because uh, these were just done uh, last week and we haven't had enough time to, to look at them in detail, uh, but have also run a higher resolution uh, uh, NE120 uh, with 273 levels, uh, and Hanley will discuss more the, the high resolution run uh, on Wednesday in the, the whole atmosphere session. And then we've also done a long term simulation uh, for both historical time period in a time slice manner, and then also for looking at future sort of space climate projections. And I'll just show one result uh, from the sort of historical and future simulations for, for Black MX. So on the left here, uh, is showing the mean temperature uh, for every decade it, for solar minimum conditions at 400 kilometers. Uh, and you can see from 1920 to present day, there's a fairly significant decrease in the temperature, and that's associated also with a, a drop in the uh, thermosphere neutral density, which is quite important for uh, satellite drag. Um, and then on the right is a if we run a projection scenario into the future, uh, where you can see the this is again 400 kilometers altitude. You can see a solar cycle variation, but if you look at the kind of solar minimum period, there's this kind of constant decline in the, the thermosphere temperature, which is basically a contraction or cooling of thermosphere uh, that we get from uh, uh, increasing uh, CO2 in the upper atmosphere, create this cooling effect, and this would then have significant effect on the, the thermosphere density. Uh, one caveat with all of these is that the, the physics time step in WACMX is much shorter, and so that requires kind of retuning uh, of the microphysics. And Adam uh, Harrington uh, did a lot of work for tuning these parameters uh, on shorter runs, uh, but the surface warming in these is still slightly larger in the coupled projection run uh, than would be expected from CAM or, or WACM simulation. So though we get this sort of trend in the thermosphere, we still need to understand what effects the sort of different climate in the lower atmosphere might have. Uh, and in terms of just going forward for the uh, whole atmosphere uh, working group, uh, uh, the, the green here shows sort of development uh, priorities and where we, we are. So for Wacom, there's this photolysis uh, that I mentioned that Doug and others are working on, and hopefully that will be done uh, sometime uh, later. Uh, this spring into summer. The stability issue, I think, uh, seems to be mostly addressed uh, as far as we can tell so far. Um, so we're really focusing our effort now on the two degree tuning uh, and any possible retuning as, as needed. And then we'll start the transition to one degree tuning uh, probably in the next uh, few months, I would say. And then for the Wacom X is here on the bottom. We mostly completed the development for the SE uh, extension and then regridding has also been done. Uh, a new electrodynamics module is being developed. Uh, and if that can be done by the summer, we, we may incorporate that in the next release. Uh, and we still need to kind of finalize what configurations uh, for Wacom X we'd like to, to include uh, for, the, for the release version. 
so I will stop there and I think uh, we will take questions uh, later. You know where the other talking. I think it's fine, right? Or do we need to do slideshow or something? You need to open it with from you. Thanks so much for doing that. <laughs> okay, yeah, welcome uh, everybody, also everybody online. I know there's a bunch of people. Um, I'm Simone Thomas. I'm the uh, co-chair for the Chemistry Climate Working Group, and I also acknowledge my co-chair, uh, Rafa Fernandez, who is uh, online this time. He's the outside co-chair, and we have now two liaisons, a more scientific liaison, Rebecca Buchholz, and we also have a technical liaison, Sean Humikel, who is here and joined our team. So this is great help for us uh, to continue our work, and Francis Witt is our software engineer. And I want to start with the timeline you ended with, with this. So the Chemistry Climate Working Group is responsible for updating the chemistry and the aerosols for CMIP7 including other things, of course. And I wanted to start with the timeline here. So um, it kind of gives an overview of the talks that we're gonna see during the working group meeting, mostly tomorrow, and then also our plans. And then later we go into other developments. So what you, uh, just to point out, uh, the full chemistry, a full chemistry realization is important um, for our developments uh, because uh, we do, even though we see a lot of results with simplified chemistry, we do need the full chemistry because they give us the prescribed fields, the aerosols and the stratosphere and the oxidants that we need. So we need to um, develop it carefully and, and run through the same process as, as simplified chemistry. Um, so in terms of developments, uh, there are two main things that I want to point out. One is we do aerosol changes uh, through the uh, new dust emission scheme that we want to integrate. And this directly affects aerosols, cloud, and radiation. And since the working group AMWG is really uh, working on tuning the clouds and the model, we really want to get this in as fast as possible. So we're hoping that this can be done in about six to eight uh, weeks. This is, of course, an optimistic timeline. Um, but this will, again, this is important to get in so tuning activities can adjust to it. Other things will affect the chemistry, and with that also the aerosols, ozone, and oxidant, oxidants, and radiation. But I think it will be a minor effect on the tuning activities, hopefully at least. But in the end, we do have to bring it all together um, with uh, the simplified chemistry. So uh, the second part we have is uh, soil NOx emissions that we think uh, we hopefully get in before the release that will change the chemistry. Uh, we do have the new photolysis scheme that uh, you just pointed out, Nick. And then gravity wave tuning is a big thing that Huli is working on. Before uh, gravity wave tuning is important because it does impact not only the dynamics, but with that the chemistry. If we have that really cold polar vortex, we don't have the right ozone hole, and that really changes our chemistry, that changes the troposphere chemistry. So we really need to get there to get a closer, uh, as close as possible to what we were, or even better, hopefully. And so uh, that's what we have to do before we can run our fully coupled chemistry simulations uh, for reasonable um, results. And there's another thing I'm going to talk about is the climate chemistry test. So we do have a model that is still quite expensive, even though we work with the mid-top model, we'll talk about it. We're trying to develop a little simpler chemistry that may be a little bit cheaper. And I, I, I will uh, come to it in the next slide. We will see a talk on that by Louisa Emmons as well tomorrow morning. One thing we haven't started yet is also we need to think about the upper boundary 
uh, we haven't talked about it much. Uh, there are some tests that has to have to be done before we can do the fully coupled runs. Um, but first, uh, the goal is before the work, summer working group meeting to do some fixed SST runs. Once we have the gravity weight tuning, to really start tuning the model also for QBO, like you saw for YCAM, uh, to get the dynamics and everything working properly. Produce forcing files and then also hand that over to the simplified chemistry runs. And after that, doing the BK simulations. So I want to talk a little bit about chemistry because there's often a big question on what is in there, what do we need, what are you doing? And I have uh, some slides. And as we remember, we have the high top model WACM that goes to 140 kilometers. Now we have 132 levels instead of before 72 levels, I think. Now we have our workhorse model 93 levels going up to 80 kilometers. And occasionally or often well good for testing or high resolution is the low top model. 40 kilometers. In terms of chemistry, so the Wacom chemistry, traditionally we use TSMLT, which is the troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, lower atmosphere chemistry that was used in CMIP 6. We used that for all the uh, realizations to get our forcing fields for the uh, prescribed chemistry runs or simplified chemistry runs. And um, this is something that is still possible in Wacom. But Nick had already talked about that Wacom is really expensive at the moment. And a model with this configuration hasn't yet done because it's probably much more expensive than what is done as a standard model is right now, the middle atmosphere Wacom chemistry, which is that we really have a comprehensive chemistry in the stratosphere, but the troposphere is not, and it's not useful really for tropospheric ozone or oxidants to be used. But it only has 100 tracers, which makes it like the 25K that you presented, uh, feasible for one degree model. Um, then there's the specified chemistry, or we call it now greenhouse gas chemistry, that really has a simple interactive uh, greenhouse gas chemistry that transports uh, methane and, and CO2 and other things. One thing to point out here too is that WACAM now and the TSMLT version, as well as other versions that have full stratosphere chemistry, use the MAM5 model aerosol model. So we have a fifth mode that is new that describes aerosols in the stratosphere, the production and the movement that will go down and also merge with the troposphere. However, if we run any simplified specified chemistry scheme, we still use the MAM5, uh, MAM4 version basically. So only four modes, the stratosphere mode is not there, but we do change, we do have changed basically the mod mode width of the, uh, with this change. We have a different width than the course mode. And so there are changes in the distribution as well. And so now for the chemistry uh, that we use for the workhorse model, or also for the low top model, and we call this, uh, first of all, air quality chemistry. That's the Mozart, the Mozart uh, TS1 chemistry we have used for CMIP 6. This is really suited for air quality studies as well as for climate studies. It's comprehensive, like why can we just doesn't have the upper part of the mesosphere lower thermosphere. And uh, that's that's uh, fairly, uh, it has 231 traces and was uh, useful, but it's still pretty uh, expensive. We are also at about 25K uh, with not as good as a throughput for one year. So still an expensive chemistry. But that doesn't mean that's all we can do. We have way more expensive chemistry in our chem, 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 chem uh, inventory, basically. We're developing more complex chemistry with specific alkane oxidations. This is something to really look more into the air quality questions. But then we also have a chemistry which is called the short-lived halogen chemistry. And that has a much better representation of halogen emissions, the burden, the strategy. And that's really actually the most realistic greenhouse gas chemistry. Uh, REFRA and a lot of people are developing that, which can be run in both the WACM and the ChemChem uh, configurations. And then we also have uh, different aerosol schemes that can be run, like the mosaic scheme with nitrates. We do have a karma model uh, with, with sectional aerosol schemes, so that's in terms of aerosols. But again, they're getting more expensive, the schemes, and uh, maybe we need to be cheaper. So uh, Luisa is working on a mechanism that's based on the old Mozart 3 chemical mechanism, which is still the fully coupled stratosphere chemistry, but it really also has a simplified troposphere chemistry, which still has, um, how many? 
I didn't put the number of tracers here. Luisa will talk about that. But it, it's about 30% uh, cheaper, but it still represents full ozone chemistry, but not as comprehensive as the TS1. And then again, uh, what Kim is doing uh, using in, in test form is often the greenhouse gas chemistry, which is really the cheap chemistry. So to illustrate this here, it's like, uh, a little bit of, uh, so we have our WACAM configurations, which are probably too expensive to run with TSMLT, at least at the moment, but WACAM is still really important because we need upper boundary conditions. We need that for our configurations and still have to test it, as I mentioned. Then we have our air quality chemistry with various different variations. And now we want to develop a climate chemistry that is 141 tracers, so a little less expensive, still has to be tested that then can provide the oxidants for, uh, for the input data for oxidants, ozone, and stratospheric ozone. And so I hope this helps a little bit, uh, but I'm happy to uh, answer any questions on that. Other developments are, uh, well, quickly, we are looking at uh, Chem 6 um, physics still in our configurations, even with the development version, because some people really want to do some science with the newest updates without waiting for the new development version to be integrated. So we have some quick results on that just to give the users and, and uh, do you, yeah, some idea on the performance. There are other developments. Uh, we, we still further investigate in uh, improved chemistry like the TS3 chemistry. I have one slide on the geoschem and hemp co uh, emission development in the end, uh, and you get will see. Well, some of you will see a talk on Wednesday, but I want to show it since there was a lot of effort going in software engineering wise uh, in this effort. Uh, we do still work on chem chem impasse. Um, we'll have, as I said, uh, karma configurations that we are working on the short lived chemistry. And we have a talk also on the uh, methane emission driven simulations uh, that we can see tomorrow afternoon. And then there are still some issues that we haven't addressed that we don't think we can do before the code free slightly. So just well, quickly, uh, Chem 6 physics uh, for people, uh, for the Chem Chem uh, community, we often use 32 levels, notched meteorology to do simulations like musical simulations, high resolution or regional refinement. Um, I mean, not uh, regional refinement is not finite volume, but finite volume was the standard model version. And uh, we looked at the results uh, just running it in the current uh, or somewhat latest development version. One thing to point out is that there is an issue in that configuration um, with water vapor. We have a high bias, while other configurations with 58 and 93 levels look pretty reasonable at this point. So we need to caution users that if they want to use this for science, they have to be careful. Um, and, and we really suggest that new users move over to the new resolutions, so C-SLAM as well as the uh, higher vertical uh, levels in the low and the mid top. Um, some chemistry results. Um, this shows uh, com comparisons, again, with Chem 6 physics. Different uh, vertical levels and also 32 finite volume. And in, in principle, what you see is that the data is uh, comp composites of ATOM observations, aircraft data in black. And then the different lines are the different configurations for the chemistry versions. And they look very similar. So this is in a way a good thing because uh, even this is averaged over different regions, we do have confidence that uh, we do get similar results that we're expecting. We don't see any uh, red herrings or something that, that may throw us off at the moment. So that's a good thing. But we do obviously have to look in a lot of more detail on what does the vertical resolution actually bring us for chemistry. So there's a lot of things we want to look at and understand. One thing I do have a plot for actually the chem six, uh, for the chem development version that we were talking about. We did some comparison with chemistry for the um, low top model, a historical run, uh, free running, I mean, fixed SST um, over 10 years, and then the mid top model in blue, and then the mid top model that Peter has developed that is more optimized, science optimized performance. And what you can see for stratosphere, color ozone, and um, well, actually, the black line is observations from MLS, and the colors are the other configuration. It looks really good. And you, you know, we talked about the cold bias. 
these two configurations for the midtop has somewhat a tuning that we implemented that will not be the final tuning that Hula is working on. But we, are, we, we do have that really low, a bit of a low bias, but it's not that bad. When we don't do any tuning, that's what the low top model shows really are bad in, in the, um, you know, northern, uh, in the southern hemisphere um, ozone hole area. So we, we do have to fix that. Um, one quick thing is also we will have a talk on Wednesday in our chemistry session. We will start to uh, work on the ADF, the AMWU Diagnostic Framework, to actually integrate chemistry diagnostics. So far, it's mostly not integrated yet. So Sean has helped a lot, as well as Justin Richling, to, to really get, bring us forward there. We hope that we soon have some aerosol tables and the default output. And here's an example for ozone zone diagnostics that goes from the old diagnostic to the new diagnostic. So we are quite happy that this is moving forward to help us evaluate the model. And this is the last slide. This is on the GeoSchem implementation. As I said before, so the Harvard group and Hai Ping Ling, who will uh, talk on Wednesday in the chemistry session, and put a lot of work in the GeoSchem development that is now actually integrated in our CSM2 framework. So you can run either ChemCam or GeoSchem. GeoSchem is usually a chemistry uh, transport model, so it's not a climate model. This allows them to actually integrate in a model that has full coupling with the land, the ocean, and the sea ice. And they, I mean, this, the community is quite large and quite happy about this progress. The other thing that we are also happy about is this a new implementation of an emission scheme, which is called HEMCO, and we had some presentations in the past on this one that will improve and, and make it easier in the future to really use uh, emissions data sets, specified emission data sets, and so on. So more on that will come in future meetings. And with that, I want to stop, and hopefully I didn't go too much over. Thank you. Questions for everybody, right? Yes, yeah, any questions for the overview of docs? Reach. What is the difference between CamCam and GeosCam effectively? Why would you use GeosCam as opposed to CamCam? GeoSchem is a different chemistry climate model. It has a different chemistry mechanism. It actually has different emissions usually. It uses different description of sea salt and dust. It uses different lightning knocks. So in one way, it is really good to have two models in one framework. You can do much more comparison in one framework. The other thing is also, I mean, a, a chemistry transport model cannot be coupled. But that's their advantage, right? The, the advantage of the Geos chem community to be integrated in this framework is adding to the CSM community, I would say. Does that answer? Yeah, I'm just wondering what. Yeah, yeah. Could you take pieces of the mechanism out of Geos chem and put it in a chem cam? You could kind of uh, do things like that. Yeah. Question about the water vapor. So you find that the the lower resolution is biased compared to OBS, and then it gets better. But without chemistry, that wasn't true. I don't know if we ever run without chemistry and F32 in the development, in the Chem6 version? Yeah, so it's it gets worse with higher resolution. It's kind of spot on with the, like, regular CSM2, and then you increase the resolution and it gets worse. So I guess something about chemistry is making it wetter no, I, I mean, I don't know. That's a good question. We should really look into this. I think what happened was when we did the uh, finite volume in the whatever, late, in one of the latest 121 or 32 versions and just run it. This is how it looks. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know if it's without chemistry because I, we haven't done that. Yeah. The, the chemistry should not ch change with water vapor bias. Really. Yeah. But we can talk about that. Uh, I think Julio is first. I think I have a question for Nick. Um, you showed results from uh, what you were calling it, sort of the last tuned up version that Nick Davis yeah. put. What, what was the vertical structure in that? That was the same vertical structure. So that was the 135 levels. So that's the, the Wacom vertical the, structure. Yeah. yeah. So both, those all have the same vertical grid, uh, but he okay. was using sort of different physics okay. and an older tag. 
It was tag 93. Yeah. And Something because, changed in between there and 132. Yeah. <laughs> My memory is he was also running those with count of six physics. I could be for, forgetting, but I think he wasn't using development physics okay. in those ones. Hey, Doug? Yeah, I got a little confused. You were showing the mid top model in the Antarctic region and Lackham, and it looked like the mid top model with whatever tuning you had picked had pretty good ozone depletion, but Lackham never gets that. Well, what the the because of the cold bias. That's good. <laughs> yeah, well, it must be better here. Well, it's still it's still underestimating, right? But at the moment, what we did was some tuning that we played with something that we if, if we get the gravity waves to produce less strong of a polar vortex, obviously our chemistry is approving and that's what we can do. And uh, I'm really looking forward to Julio's talk uh, to see what what else we can do. We have some options to do this. Wacom hasn't applied this tuning at the moment, but that will be work in progress. Not this tuning, but probably more likely what Julio is working on. Okay. Good. I also had a question for Nick. Uh, I understand that models being unstable is bad. You have to fix it. <laughs> but um, the strong divergence damping above 80 kilometers, it'll also affect, of course, divergent waves, any resolved gravity waves in the model. It'll damp those. And I just wondered if there are any observations that could be used up there to at least inform you whether you're excessively damping resolved waves. So I didn't include in this presentation, uh, but it, uh, I think it was either Rolando or Peter who looked at the power spectrum and it, including this didn't have a significant negative effect. Uh, I could yeah, show I you the, later. Yeah, so it's, um, I have to remember it's a hybrid effusion, it's del four, not yeah, del two, so, yeah. so it's more scale selective. So we did a power spectra of the kinetic energy, you know, 10 layers from the top, 20 layers. So so we were really, we were damping strongly the two delta X, four delta X, and then <laughs> really tapers off around the six. So if you're worried about anything below six delta X, and it's divergent, then it's damped pretty heavily. But there's something going on that this is not just spectral elements. MPAS has been struggling with high tug. When I talk to uh, the Navy, they're struggling as well. So there's something dynamically above 80 kilometers that really challenges the die core. So it's been quite hard for these newer die cores that are not as diffusive to, to be stable. Right. So all the high tug users here have, have been very frustrated for many years. But it's, it's been a challenge. So we decided just to hammer it to the floor. You play Rolando? I, yes, uh, I mean, um, Peter said something happens over 80 kilometers. What happens is that the gravity waves grow exponentially uh, with altitude, and at some point they're going to get too large. And in particular, the, uh, the short ones are going to produce a lot of divergence, therefore a lot of vertical motion. And that screws up the uh, vertical remapping. So the solution I think that uh, Peter has implemented, which I think is very nice, is to actually attack those uh, very short waves. As he pointed out, if you compare uh, simulations with and without this um, uh, delta four damping down coming down to eighty kilometers, uh, the main difference in the uh, spectra is uh, beyond uh, six delta x. So I don't think we are losing anything, and we are gaining the ability to run this model with a much smaller end split and therefore much more rapidly. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Online, maybe? Hey, we're gonna get a longer break here. Thanks. So yeah, we're gonna reconvene at, at two oh five, then have two talks, and I think we're not gonna get coffee on the next break. Two oh five. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah.
switch to the end then. <laughs> All righty, as I mentioned early on, we're now going to have a series of talks uh, talking about everything new going into PAM 7 or every, anything new maybe going into PAM 7 or hopefully. So, Ayla will start out with a vertical resolution. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, so I want to acknowledge everyone that's listed here that's uh, contributed in some way to what I'm going to show. Um, so the change in patents vertical resolution is kind of old news at this point. We had this task team back in 2020, and the decision was made in 2021. So why am I talking about this now? Well, one reason is I'm kind of in the process of writing up the results of all that task team work, so things are a bit more organized than they were before, and I also want to introduce some new simulations that will be coming soon that can be used to look at the impacts of the change in the vertical grid. Um, so just a couple of notes. I'm not going to focus on the changes in the boundary layer, because when you do that, you have to change all the tuning and the physics, and it becomes a different model. Um, and everything I'm going to show is with CSM2, with CAM6 physics, and the FB die core. So none of the other changes that will be in CAM7 are in what I'm going to show. So everything could look very different uh, when we get to CAM7, but uh, these are kind of clean tests of the impact of the vertical resolution. So why are we changing CAM's vertical resolution? Well, this is what we currently have. We've got the high top WACM and the low top CAM6. What you see here is the, the grid spacing uh, as a function of height. Um, and so there are a number of reasons why we want to enhance CAM's vertical resolution. One is that it's now pretty well established that the stratosphere has an impact on the troposphere. And while Wacom represents that pretty well, CAM is kind of behind uh, the times in terms of its resolution with having a model live at 40 kilometers. Most kind of CMIP class models have, have extended their uh, model top to higher at this point. Um, another reason is that even though Wacom has a good representation of the stratosphere, it's still a bit deficient in resolution to really capture uh, the QBO properly. So Rolando and Yaga had this paper where they looked at this 110 level version, which has more like 500 meter grid spacing in the troposphere uh, and find that they could produce a much better representation of the QBO with that. Uh, another reason is Wacom is kind of really difficult to initialize with other reanalysis products because the lid is so high. So we kind of want to have a stratosphere resolving model, but with a lid that's low enough that we can still uh, initialize from other reanalysis for kind of S2S type applications. Also, of course, as you move to higher horizontal resolution, uh, you're likely to benefit from having higher vertical resolution. And then there are motivations to change the boundary layer as well, which is not something I'm really talking about here. So first of all, I just want to give you some motivation why we should care about the QBO, because that's largely what I'm going to end up uh, talking about. And so you can ask ChatGPT. He <laughs> <laughs> says, well, while it may seem distant and irrelevant to everyday life, <laughs> actually has significant impacts on weather patterns and climate. <laughs> so then I discussed this with Cecile. She thought maybe I wasn't asking the right question. So she asked, well, why should I not care about the QBO? And it says, unless you're a meteorologist or atmospheric scientist or someone studying climate patterns, it's not something you need to learn about. <laughs> For all atmospheric scientists, whichever way you ask it, uh, you need to care about the QBO. <laughs> so, but to me, the most compelling reason is kind of these different links between the QBO and the MJO. So here is just a, a metric of MJO variability. So you've got all your uh, MJO variants here over the maritime continent. Um, and what's been shown is that if you kind of pull out years that are characterized by westerly QBO, and you look at the anomalies in this metric compared to climatology, you see less MGO variability. And if you pull out years that are characterized by easterly QBO, 
you see the opposite. So there's some indications that there's uh, modulation of the MJO by the QBO, and the, these differences are not small. They're a pretty substantial fraction of the climatology. So this is a kind of a potential source of predictability given the long time scales involved in the QBO. So the vertical resolution task team, we kind of set about uh, trying to understand what's the impact of changing the vertical resolution, particularly with a focus on the QBO, because that's one of the things we know resolution is going to matter for. So we ran a bunch of simulations that had the 140 kilometer top and they had different grids going from 1000 meters down to 400 meter resolution with 100 meter increments. And so what I'm going to show you is composites of the QBO. And so to just illustrate the method, here are equatorial zonal mean zonal winds in one of the simulations. And what we're going to do is take the 60 hectopascal level um, and find the time at which uh, the winds transition from easterly to westerly and composite lagged relative to those times. So this is what you get. So you kind of think of this as a life cycle of a QBO transition from easterly to westerly. Uh, we've got the era five reanalysis as our observation based data here on the left and then all the simulations uh, going from low to high resolution on the right. And so they all have a QBO to my eye. They all kind of look good. Uh, but if you kind of focus in uh, on the, the oh, well, this is difficult. I don't know, I'm going to do this instead. Okay. Yeah, focus in on the 80 hectopascal level, uh, which is shown there. And you can see that the the kind of uh, the lower resolution runs, the, the westerlies don't extend quite down to that level. Whereas you go to higher resolution, like in this 500 meter case, the westerly phase kind of distend, extends down to that level. You can look at the QBO amplitude. So this is the, the metric of the, the uh, amplitude on the x-axis and then height on the y-axis. And the black line is the era five. And then these colored lines are the lower resolution uh, simulations. Um, and you can see that they are deficient in the amplitude. And as you increase resolution, the amplitude gets higher. So here's the 800 meter case and the 700 meter case, which ends up getting pretty close to era five. Um, and then if you increase it further, uh, there's not that much in it. So kind of what we learned from this is if you have resolutions lower than about 700 meters, they seem to have deficiencies in the amplitude of the QBO. Uh, but what about the processes that are driving the QBO? So gravity waves play a role, but they're parametrized. So you have some scope for tuning them. Uh, but resolved waves also play a role. And so um, that's more difficult to treat. So what I'm going to show here is the uh, resolved wave driving. So this is the tendencies of the zonal mean zonal wind due to resolved waves. Uh, and this is erified here on the left. And if you focus in on kind of that green line, you can see that as the QBO is transitioning from easterly to westerly, the resolved waves are giving you some of that westerly tendency. Now, if we look at the lower resolution runs, you can see that you're just lacking in that red there, the driving of that westerly phase by the resolved wave. Uh, but as you increase resolution, you see more and more red there. And as you get to 500 meters, it's kind of extending higher up into the stratosphere. And, and you seem to have an, an improvement in the role of the resolved waves in driving the QBO. And the reason is we're really improving our representation of the momentum fluxes due to Kelvin waves. So here I'm showing uh, wave number frequency spectra of the vertical eddy momentum flux. This is at 50 hectopascals. And so that blue there, that's in the region of the spectrum of Kelvin waves, and it's an upward flux of westerly momentum. And if you look at that as a function of resolution, you can see that at the lower resolutions, you're kind of lacking in that. And then as you go to the higher resolutions, you get more. Uh, and you see the same thing if you just look at the amplitude of the Kelvin wave. So this is a power spectra of vertical velocity. And again, you're lacking it in the lower resolutions and you get more and more as you go to higher resolution and it starts to look more like your applied. One other thing I just want to point out, and I have some extra slides if you hear about other aspects of tropical waves, but one thing I'm going to show here is um, this MJO metrics. So this is, uh, I'm not using OLR here just because of the data availability. This is vertical velocity. But again, we've got our MJO activity over the maritime continent. And if we look at that as a function of resolution, you see a kind of systematic increase in that as you go to higher resolution as well, getting closer to the reanalysis. 
So uh, overall, changing the grid spacing impacts particularly on the QDO and the role of the resolved waves in driving that. And things look a bit better once you get to about 500 meter resolution, which is consistent with Rolando and Yaga's previous work. So then we asked what happens if we lower the model top to 80 kilometers and we ran a bunch of simulations to show uh, that. And I, I won't go into it here. The short answer is that not a lot really changes. The QBO still looks good and other aspects kind of look as good um, as, as in the 140 kilometer top, at least below about 10 hectopascals. So the final grid then, this is what we have before. Uh, and this is the new mid top grid. So we have this 500 meter resolution in the troposphere, it then tapers off to, to half a scale height at 3.5 kilometers. Uh, and then it's constant like that up until you're in the sponge layer. So uh, Wacom can be built on top of this, as is what's going on. We also have this low top model, um, which tapers off much more quickly. And that obviously doesn't have the QDO or the, the, the improvements in the wave that I talked about. Um, and then, of course, there's also changes in the boundary layer, which I haven't really gone into. So in the end, we have this 93 level model for the mid top and a 58 level model for the low top. Um, but in the intermediate case, there's these new simulations that are coming along with an 83 level configuration, which has all the changes in the free troposphere and stratosphere resolution, but not changing the boundary layer. So nothing else is changing in these simulations uh, in terms of the physics. And we have some free running simulations, which will be coming soon, run by the Climate Variability and Change Working Group. Uh, and we also have this project with uh, scripts to run these S2S predictions with this grid to look at how does the stratosphere impact predictability. And so I'll just finish up with showing you the skill of the QBO uh, in those S2S predictions. So this is mean squared skill score of equatorial winds as a function of time. Uh, time on the x-axis. Uh, and so you have there in the low top model, you have some skill in the equatorial winds, but it drops off kind of quickly. And this is what we get in the mid top meta model. So now you have much better skill at predicting the, the equatorial winds out to, on a six month lead time. We can ask, do we get this QBO MGO connection that we see in era five? Um, that's what we get in the low top model. <coughs> And unfortunately, that's what we get in the high top model. So even though we have this uh, super QBO, we're unfortunately still not capturing the QBO MDO connection. So to conclude, these are the new grids. Uh, the mid top resolution allows us to capture the QBO and the associated wave driving process as well. Um, there are also some improvements in other aspects of tropical waves. There's also some degradations, uh, which I haven't gone into. We have these free running and S2S simulations that will come available soon. Uh, and despite having this really good QBO, we're still not capturing the QBO MBO connection, but at least we have one of the pieces there and we can work towards trying to get that uh, in the future. So thanks a lot. Um, what is the resolution of the era five model in the stratosphere? Uh, it well in the in the troposphere and the lower stratosphere, it go, it varies between about three hundred meters to five hundred meters, I think. So it's a bit higher than our new grid, um, and I think it has a top of about eighty kilometers. <clears throat> Uh, I was wondering uh, if uh, I was a bit surprised that when you increase the uh, resolution further, then you know some get worse. Uh, I was wondering if you increase the resolution, the horizontal resolution, at the same time, if that you know could help even yeah. in, improve. Uh, so you're referring to that the resolved way of driving getting uh, a bit worse at 400 meters. No, you you were uh, at at first you did a bunch of experiment where you show the QBO was better, best result at about 700 meters, right? When you further increase uh, beyond um, that, it's, it seems that it's not so great. Well, I don't know. I think that's really the red one's the best one, which is 500. But I guess higher up, I guess it is degrading a bit. The resolution actually is degrading more quickly in the 400 and 500 meter case. So that might be why, but maybe Rolando wants to 
Uh, yes, uh, one thing that may be the case here is that the um, these rungs may not all be optimally tuned for gravity waves. So as you change, uh, say, the winds in lower stratosphere, you may actually have to tune the uh, uh, gravity wave fluxes to get uh, the, um, the a, a better simulation, say, above uh, 20 hectopascals. So that's something we never tried with this set of runs. And uh, all that we showed is that the amplitude does increase as you go to higher resolution in lower stratosphere, but we never tried to do anything about tuning the uh, the uh, QBO in the mid and upper stratosphere by uh, tuning the gravity waves. So that, that's something that really needs to be looked into. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, when you increase the vertical resolution, did you change the tuning at all of the waves? Or no, they're all kept the same. Okay. Yeah, that, that's the point I just made. We, we never did that. Okay. Sort of obvious question is, do you, have a, or do you or someone else have a hypothesis why the, there's no QPO and QPO connection? Um, no, but it, it's not surprising to me. Like, even when you nudge the observed QPO, we, we still don't get it. So. I don't know. I guess it's maybe because the, the MJO we have is not a good enough bridge that probably. Yaka was talking to Yaka yesterday, or she, she just put it in there. <laughs> sure, say. Okay. Connection doesn't go high enough. <laughs> but now we have the QBO, we can figure it out. Oh, okay. Go ahead, so then with the convection, if we have the higher boundary layer levels at the amount, will that change maybe? Do you mean having the QBO and GAO connection? Will yeah. that change? Um, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we haven't searched for it yet in, with CAM6 development physics. We could do well when we have a long enough mint opera. Yeah, maybe it'll disappear. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Ella. Uh, so we, before we dive into uh, the boundary layer radiation, I'm going to talk about dicolors. All righty, so. Um, I'm going to give a presentation kind of summarizing everything that I've done to the spectral uh, element DICOR uh, since the code base was cited in SISL here, and we were jointly uh, developing the spectral element DICOR with EUE that, that stopped. And after that, we, we moved the code into CAM and then a number of changes for, for various reasons. So this is probably 10 years on and off. You sort of summarized here. Uh, so one thing we started out with doing was to move to a dry mass vertical coordinate. Um, so most uh, global traditional modeling systems uh, would use what I call, call a moist vertical coordinate, where your coordinate levels are defined in terms of the full moist surface pressure here, and then you have your A's and B coefficients. So B is zero at the surface, simplifying the about the lower boundary condition, and that get up to the model top, A is one and B is zero, and you have a constant pressure top. If you write the uh, continuity equation using a Lagrangian vertical coordinate, uh, using those assumptions, you end up with this term. Here's your pressure level, change of pressure level, thickness is basically just your divergence of mass in and out of the grid cell. <laughs> Uh, but you will have a right hand side here that is due to changes of, of water in the system. So if it rains or evaporates, then you will have a source and a sink term over here. Moving to a dry mass vertical coordinate, now your pressure levels here are defined in terms of a dry surface pressure here. Uh, but then you use the same, you know, A and B coefficients. And if you do that, then you get rid of this right hand uh, source of sink terms so if, it, if it rains or if you have evaporation the coordinate levels don't change your continuity equation doesn't have this uh, right hand term here um, just to uh, 
if you're interested in this kind of stuff, uh, Ethan WF actually looked into this. They have a fixer to make the model conserve uh, moist mass, uh, but there's a seasonal cycle in the dry mass in the system that um, the chemists are not particularly happy about. So that's one change uh, that went uh, into, into the system. Uh, so one one reason was this to have vertical coordinate that didn't move. You know, ultimately, we'd like to use that that in physics one day. Um, another reason was it made it easier to, to um, couple this system to a new transport scheme, uh, separate grids. So uh, the spectral element dynamical core is using uh, <coughs> using a uh, what's called a, a Harmonic cube sphere uh, grid, which is shown here. So you have uh, six panels on the cube sphere and an analytically generated grid. And then inside each of these quadrilaterals here, you have this quadrature grid here, and that's used to perform uh, mathematical operations on the spectral transformed uh, polynomial basis functions. Um, and these points here are not like Cartesian grid inside here. Those are these are quadrature points. So to get higher order accuracy, you, you use this grid here, which is called the GLL grid. A while ago, when uh, when Adam Harrington was was a postdoc, he came and worked with me on this, and and we showed in idealized simulations that um, at the boundaries of these elements here, where the basis functions are only C zero, meaning you have the same value, but the derivatives are, are discontinuous that that can lead to some spurious behavior in, in the system. Um, so that was one argument. Uh, there are others to introduce what we call a physics grid, where we divide these quadrilaterals into a quasi-equal area grid. And what we argued is that, that it would be um, better to integrate the, the basis functions here over these uh, grid cells here, and then pass that to physics, and physics would then compute its, its tendencies based on that. So that's what we call the PG free grid, so the physics grid that's free by free. There's also the functionality uh, to run physics on a coarser resolution uh, grid. Uh, one advantage of doing that is you compute physics in less than half of the physics columns. So you physics is expensive. That's a way to reduce computational cost. That's a method that uh, the DOE EPSM uh, has adopted. Um, you may also run physics on, on a finer grid if you want to explore that uh, as well. But we are running this three by three physics grid where we have roughly the same degrees of freedom as on the as on the dynamics grid. And this idea here is also being uh, not only thought by UPSM, but also the UK Met Office is using to separate transport and physics and have them run on, on different grids in their future modeling systems. At least as an editor, James, I'm getting clear for this now. Um, we also uh, introduced a more accurate and faster transport scheme called uh, CSLAM that lives on, on PG3 type grid, shown up here. Uh, and I won't go into all the details here, but it was much more complicated than I had first thought to consistently couple, you know, this transport scheme with the spectral element dynamical core. And I did that in collaboration with DOE and all the glory details that, that in that paper here. But when you separate all these grids, there are certain consistencies you really have to pay attention to. All right, so we introduced dry mass vertical coordinate. We introduced uh, these grids to accommodate a uh, faster uh, transport scheme and also run physics on a more equal area grid rather than using quadrature points. The other change we have made is, is going to effectively uh, variable latent heat instead of using constant latent heat. So I'm going to um, talk about that using uh, the energy equation for. Um, shallow atmosphere hydrostatic system. Um, so if you integrate the globally integrated energy equation looks like this. So you have the time derivative, the global integral of this quantity here, and that should equal um, the flux terms here on the right hand side. So rho here is the dry density of air, then you have the kinetic energy term, you have the term related to, to potential energy, and then you have enthalpy. So this is for 
dry air, and then you have exactly the same terms here for all components. The other components of moist air, so water vapor, if you include them also, they condensates. And as soon as you have water in the system, you need to define a reference state for enthalpy. You use that of ice and then associated uh, reference temperature. Then you have the latent heat terms here related to, uh, the, to phase changes. You know, they happen in physics, not in the dicor, but they are part of the energy equation. And then you have matching terms down here where uh, we have the fluxes. So here are the latent heat terms of the, the net flux of water vapor and liquid here, and then you know, the same latent, latent uh, constant terms here. And then I put uh, sensible heat flux and radiation into this term right here. Also, there are matching enthalpy flux term and kinetic energy and the potential terms here, but I'm not aware of any global modeling system that actually including these terms uh, in their modeling system. So this is what home was using or the old SDI core, so to speak. So the changes we've made is that um, we move to variable latent heats. And the reason why I say variable latent heats can be seen on this equation here where the more accurate approximation of, of uh, the latent heat is to have a temperature dependence, of course, to the difference between the heat capacities here. But if you make the assumption that's usually done where you just use the same heat capacity for all components of moist air, you know, then that temperature depend dependency goes away and you just have the constant left. So we have relaxed that uh, assumption in, in the spectral new version of the spectral element die cores. Now you have the appropriate heat capacities for, for the components of moist air. And also we've done the same as what high, high resolution weather models do. We include all the components of moist air in the pressure. So probably equipped rain, snow, and, and uh, gravel. That really only matters if you go to really high resolution. Since we have changed the uh, energy formulation of the dike core, and we have an energy fixer in physics site that, among other things, fixes spurious energy errors from the die core. We have to reformulate that energy fixer to support this uh, change. We also expanded CAM physics to be able to be coupled consistently with the NPAS dynamical core that has a different energy formula. That's a constant volume model. So the pressure is not constant at the top, but height is. That changes the energy formula. Uh, so now CAM physics has is, is, um, become more general in terms of accommodating different formulas uh, for um, used in, in, in dynamical cores. The other thing is, if you go to variable latent heat, uh, the temperature change when you add heating changes as well. So what we do to be consistent with the SE die core is at the very end of physics, we scale the temperature tendencies as if they were added under variable latent heat assumptions. You see, not every we had to change physics along with the dipole here, making it pretty complicated. So um, the CAM physics package, if you assume pressure is constant, uh, will satisfy this uh, equation here. But at the very, very end of physics, we uh, adjust pressure to accommodate for water leaving or entering. Uh, the system and the energy change associated with that, we throw into the global. Uh, energy fixer. So you see that I've crossed out these terms here. Um, and if you if you look at how large these terms are in real world simulations, they will be completely dominated by these enthalpy flux terms uh, right here. Uh, so the energy fixer here, at least locally in each column, where we fix uh, the energy. Uh, change due to changing water in the column, and most of it is in, in this term here. We would like to include that in our system here so we can close the energy budget more accurately locally. Um, but that involves the ocean. So uh, we have imported the MOM6 uh, ocean model from GFDL. Uh, and the way that uh, DICOR is formulated is that it actually has explicit specification of these enthalpy flux terms plus the latent heat terms that we've always had here. But um, they use a different reference state, which makes sense for the ocean. They use liquid uh, as a reference. 
uh, and they assume uh, constant latent heats. And the way we're running the model right now is that the energy change associated with all of this that the ocean receives is again uh, fixed with a global fixer and then and, and effectively sent to the atmosphere through the sensible heat flows. So loosely speaking, each component just does its, its own thing. They're both self consistent in that sense. So the question is if we could actually do better than that. So having made these changes to the to the uh, DICOR and CAM7 physics, we now have uh, we're working towards including explicitly including these enthalpy flux terms here in, in each column. Um, and then uh, we uh, would like to change the enthalpy flux term in column six. So they're based on variable latent heat. So you can see that the heat capacity for each component of moist air is is um, it's not constant, it's whatever the water species is that, that's going in and out. Um, so our proposal is to um, to implement this, and if you do that, then we no longer need these fixers um, in, in each component. So we still need a global energy fix in the atmosphere for, for other stuff, but it won't fix uh, these entropy fluxes. So locally, we can have a more accurate energy budget. So we're almost there. It's been a lot, a lot of work getting there so we have to change the spectrum and dicor to work for variable latent heats we have to change energy formulations and physics to work with variable latent heats so at least if effectively um, we're scaling the tendencies as i mentioned so they're consistent with the dicor and the last part here that we're very close to being done with is to uh, to send these entropy fluxes back and forth between the ocean and there's a lot of details there of what grid are you doing them on? How are you syncing it in, in time, et cetera, et cetera. So we've put a lot of help from Jim Edwards implementing this in the copper. So hopefully soon we'll be able to test this in, in real world situation. The other change uh, we've made to the, the guy for this is a close collaboration with uh, Mark Taylor uh, at UE is that we have um, introduce a reference profile. So let me show why we're doing this. So if you take Omega 500 in an AMIP simulation, this is a one year uh, average Omega 5, yeah, Omega 500 hectopascals. Um, this is our finite volume of previous workforce model. <laughs> when, when we did that with the original foam formulation of the DICOR, more or less, we kind of saw that the vertical velocities were kind of noisy over steep uh, orography. So at least if you take Finite volume as the truth. Uh, this is quite noisy, and the noise seems somewhat aligned with the edges of the spectral elements that I was referring to earlier. So together with Mark, we we uh, developed this this method where we subtracted reference the so reference profiles from temperature and pressure level thickness, where we effectively took out the topography from them, meaning that the uh, the viscosity here will be will not see the, the topography in, in the same way in the details that are in that paper. But if we do that and do similar manipulations in the pressure gradient force and use the physics grid, so three changes on top of each other, then we end up with, with this. So going from this much noise to, to this, I think that's a significant uh, improvement for flow over, over steep orbit. This has also made it possible with the spectral element core to run with much, with much rougher topography, meaning that topography is much closer to where the real world is. Um, I forgot to mention every die core needs to smooth topography, otherwise you get grid scale, grid scale noise. Some have to smooth more than others. And having MPAS in the same system, we've been interacting with the developers of MPAS, kind of looking at how you smooth topography, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, the synergy of having these different die cores in, in the same system. And it turned out they use half the amount of smooth that we use for CSM2. Uh, but with these changes to the die core, it's actually possible now to run with the same level of smoothing and, and impasse. And we're, we're currently looking into that in our coupled uh, simulation. All right, the high top uh, stability actually didn't add any, any slides, but I think Nick, you 
covered most of it. So we extended the, the hyper viscosity. This is just in Wacom, not, not in, not in um, the eight kilometer or 42 kilometer version of PAM. Um, the only other thing we haven't mentioned is that we do have a Del2 sponge in the, in the top X number of levels. I forget how many it is. I think it's like six or seven. Um, there's a horizontal Del2 sponge, and the change we made was to also add that in the vertical physics. So that's another enhancement to the sponge that allowed us to, to run the model much more safely. Uh, and last but not least, um, I won't be able to go into details here, but when you're running uh, for all these different uh, grids, you have to worry about consistencies and in the initial implementation, I played it really safe. So I ran, I vectored water vapor and all the, the condensed species on the spectral element grid with the spectral element method, which is quite slow for trace attraction. And I ran them with the C-SLAM scheme. And then every physics time step, I would overwrite the spectral element solution with the C-SLAM solution. So I turned that off and just whenever C-SLAM had an updated value, I just interpolated to the spectral element method. And we've been evaluating this and looks like um, it damaged the solution. And one thing that it did do, it actually sped up our fully coupled system by quite a bit. So you have to remember here, the full system here is all components running, physics running, etc. The only change here is a sped up dicor. And we went from uh, about eight uh, simulated years per day to, to be able to run about 10 simulated years per day. With that, I'll take questions or comments. John. Yeah, just uh, asking you to repeat, you have the uh, Cam SE with the grid looking, uh, grid aligned looking noise. And then that went away. You said there are three changes between those two yeah. slides. What were those three again? And I went over this really fast. Um, so hyperviscosity is subtract subtracting these reference profiles. And then um, pressure gradient force, you can formulate them in terms of the exna function. And then we, we subtracted a reference profile there that effectively, or well, analytically on paper, added up to zero. <laughs> basically taking out some of the effect of the steamography and that. And then the third one is to run with the physics grid where you integrate your solution over the basis uh, functions over these control volumes and all three of them um, alleviate this noise issue proceeding. Okay, thanks. Like these things here. I should have overlaid the the, the grid here, but I think some of those lines that do exactly coincide with a, with a side of an element. Again, assuming that FB is, is the truth. I have a similar plot with, with MPAS. I should have thrown that in there as well, but it definitely doesn't have those lines. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, Jeff, you want to go first? <laughs> yeah, so since we're doing initial conditions from reanalyses and then these things, is there a standard tool for interpolating from other models to this grid and how big a difference does the vertical interpolation make between the wet and dry coordinates? Uh, I think you have several questions here. You mean, so horizontal interpolation? No, no I'm just concerned about the vertical interpolation. Um, the way we decided, so we have all these grids and the, and the different vertical coordinates. So backwards compatibility when we initialize the model it can basically just it just starts from the traditional moist coordinate system and again we don't we don't initialize the traces on the c slime grid everything just comes in on spectral elements as it used to do for backwards compatibility reasons so in terms of uh, do interpolating things from uh, reanalysis is, is the usual moist uh, vertical coordinate and then Inside the model, it would do the, the conversion. The downside to that is you get a little bit of, of initial noise because you know, internally it will start interpolating the fields. It just got too complicated with 
two by two physics, three by three, four by four. Yeah, we saw that same noise with the data simulation. So. Yeah, you mentioned something about del squared vertical diffusion. I yeah. think it was. Is that just in those top six to seven levels? That yeah, only that? with the high top. Yeah, um, just the top levels, though. Yeah, so we've always traditionally models have always always had had a, a del two sponge, or relay friction, or both. But we have traditionally with spectral elements always had a del two sponge, and at the low top version, it's like two layers even in the 80 kilometer we get away with just a couple of layers but when we back them, i had to go to like things like seven eight or nine it's it's quite a few more um and then just by a method of trial and error over many many years uh, i i found out the only thing i could get to run stable was to also add the vertical diffusion so i just Add the same coefficient on the physics side so that in the top seven, eight layers, you have a, a vertical L2 coefficient similar to what the dicor is doing. So, so don't look at the top 12 layers. <laughs> That's all a sponge. Whereas, as we argued before, the del 4 sponge, we argued that should not be def definitely a lot less decremental Thank you. to the solution. So if you could run with less smooth serography because if you look to what that does, is it a good thing? And we we just run a couple of simulation and I looked it over with, with Adam and Julio and we saw some signs of, of improvement. Um, and in the uh, F the AMIP case we ran, um, there were some improvements in, in precipitation over the Antarctic and Arctic as well. But still, we have big biases in solving green, and unfortunately, they didn't get better. So, so the surface mass balance over green is probably the same as before. I was going to ask the same kind of question about the Amazon because there, wasn't there something issue with the Andes and Andes extracting too much or too little moisture or something like that? Yeah, so there were there were significant changes along the Andes. I think we got much. Trying to remember, like we always get too much precipitation in the tropics over steep orography. So Himalayas and part of the Andes get too much in New Guinea as well. That bias got slightly, uh, slightly worse. But then in the, I think it was on, on the east side of the Andes, there were pretty big changes. And I actually don't know if it's better or worse. I don't know if you remember earlier, but I think it got drier on the, on the east side. So, so there are definitely significant changes there. So we just did the run, so we haven't really looked at it in detail. I think for data simulation, you know, the closer the observation can get to the model levels, the better. The other thing I'm not mentioning here is we changed our smoothing inspired by MPAS, so we don't smooth topography over ocean. We're trying to smooth it off there, so that means that when you smooth, you know, the, the Topography won't start leaking more and more and more over ocean. Um, we thought that would help with the lab sea freeze, but that was not the trick. <laughs> All right, time for the second break. Oh, well, should we skip? <laughs> oh yeah, we should skip it. We only have two minutes. <laughs> you all got coffee you now. Is everybody good skipping the break? Yeah. You can run out and get coffee if you want. It's, it's still out there. So next up is uh, Adam. Good luck. Keep them pointing both. Interesting. All righty. So Adam is going to talk a lot about our couple of tuning exercises, <laughs> changes to physics. Yeah, this was originally called tuning tropospheric physics in a pre-industrial public setup, but that's not really my contribution. The tuning was actually pretty simple, and it was more putting the things together correctly to give a scientifically uh, realistic solution. Um, 
But then I also thought, you know, I'm not technically assembling it. That's the software engineers. So I want to give a shout out to the NCAR software engineers. Without them, we could not do this. Um, <clears throat> any of this. So, um, and then I just want to say also I'm the SEMA co-lead for CGD. So if um, you have any questions, comments, or complaints, perhaps in response to Peter's talk, you can come to me and we can talk it out. <laughs> um, so towards CAM 7, we decided to we divide it up into these different phases because we're, we're changing so much. Uh, so a couple of evaluation one um, was kind of, we, we changed, we did the bare minimum we needed to do to change the physics to make it work with our new vertical grid with the higher resolution of the boundary layer, um, the 5893 level vertical grid. Um, because what we were really changing there is we're changing the die core in the atmosphere using spectral elements, the die core in the ocean using MOM. So we didn't want to overload the system with new physics. We came up with uh, 26G as a coupled run. Um, these are just uh, global mean SSTs here and the West Pacific SSTs. Right? And so the gray line is 26G. Uh, we moved on to a couple of evaluation two, and that's where we updated all our physics towards CAM 7. And we started uh, uh, cleaning up the model, and um, we ended up with a series of runs. Uh, and we eventually ended up with coupled run 54 in green there. Um, this run had some pretty uh, has some pretty problematic biases in there. Uh, you can see already the SST variability over West Pacific is very large. Uh, that's moving towards away from observations. Um, I'm going to talk more about uh, the climatological precipitation and moisture biases that are to be poor and how how we uh, alleviated them and how we're moving forward. So um, the total precipitable water uh, climatology is given in the top two panels. AMSR2 um, is a little moister than ERA5. Uh, I do use ERA5 a lot, though, because it has so many fields available to us. Um, 26G from Copper to Val 1 looks OK. Um, sort of looks like ERA5. And then 54 was where we ran into problems. You can see the separation of the northern and southern ITCCs uh, by this sort of really dry region, um, anomalously dry region over sort of the maritime climate. Okay. Um, and so what I did, the first thing I did is I, all right, well, let's run AMIPS. Let's get the ocean out of here. So we were on some year 2000 AMIPS in the lower left and lower right with the CAM tag called 58 star star that corresponds to what we used in 26 G. And it looks okay. And then if we go into the latest tag that we're using in 54, which is tag 132, you can see that things got quite a bit drier. And each contour interval here is two millimeters of water equivalent. So a substantial drying of the West Pacific that um, so we can track down what happened between these two tags. Well, here's what happened. Uh, we updated our physics. Uh, so um, just going to go briefly over what we did. Peter mostly mentioned a lot of this. Um, the Pumas update, um, you can split it. I split it into three things. So the new physics, there's like a new process rate where we now have vapor deposition on snow. So there's a new pathway for vapor to go directly to condensate, uh, still condensate. Um, it, it was always apparently, uh, there was always vapor deposition on liquid rain is my understanding. So. We're just doing this for snow. This alone will uh, kind of dry out the water vapor in the upper stratosphere, and the clouds get a little, the ice clouds get a little thinner just by this process alone, because it's a new pathway for vapor to go to constant so the cloud. Um, we I iterated with Andrew, and we did add a limiter on there that was on the liquid, the vapor does this on liquid um, that just prioritizes the process that's faster. Um, the next two things are kind of I think. A, I think they're mostly to address sort of problems with MG2, the older microphysics. One, we did have issues with the ice limiter sort of truncating large ice numbers. And so um, there was a big refactor. And I would say that it's not like an ice limiter refactor. You're kind of just making the code come up with sensible ice number concentrations in various ways. 
And then another uh, issue that sort of came to light is there was um, some sensitivity to the time stepping, that new time stepping that um, Andrew has addressed with uh, various uh, implicit approaches uh, and corrections. Uh, the club update, um, we brought in the prognostic momentum fluctus, so that's the big change. Um, one that was more uh, subtle and kind of went, we didn't really realize is when we updated club, we turned off downgrading diffusion of theta outlet in total water. That was happening on, on top of mixing by prognostic fluxes from club. Um, and then the third thing is we looked at the lid, so club can now operate above the tropopause. Tend to get ice clouds going a little, a little higher above the tropopause, and that can hydrate the stratosphere. It might be um, one of the reasons the moisture changes uh, that Simone saw uh, in the modern. <clears throat> uh, the hack low boil diffusion is mostly to stabilize the mid high top, uh, but we activate it everywhere above where club is active. So if club is not active at layers in the troposphere, for, for some reason stops it at some inversion. The HP diffusion would be applied above that. <clears throat> and then there's some MAM5 changes that Simone talked about that are pretty subtle for the troposphere. This changes the definition of the um, mode size. So, uh, sort of identify what were the impact of all of these and which one of them maybe led to our drying of the West Pacific. I did a tag audit. So, I'm looking at um, basically running 10 year AMEP runs, bracketing all the major science changing tags. Um, so, Pumas was 046, 063, and 097. So, this is summer, the results are summarized as averages over this expanded West Pacific region of these 10 year um, climatologies of uh, various variables you may be familiar with. Um, so, let me start with ice water path here. So this is going from 045 to 046. So this is the first Pumas update. You can see the ice clouds thin. I go up here, it's total precipitable water. It got a little drier. So part of that is the vapor deposition on snow. Um, but there are other Pumas updates that kind of went in and tried to correct that. Uh, 063 here and then 097. And so we're back to sort of reasonable ice clouds. Um, 058 is this one, and I made that tag. Basically, it's um, 058, but I reverted it back to MG2 microphysics. So that's why it looks like the red, the red dot. That's what we used for coupled to value one because we didn't want to use new microphysics for that. Um, the other big change is really uh, the club update that happened between the um, this, this pastel green and the salmon. So 058 to 059. Prec L increased a lot, Prec C went down a bunch, but this big moisture drying going from this green to the salmon is very apparent. And it, all I did is in this 059 star, which is this gray line, I just changed the nameless back in 059 to turn that diffusion back on. And so what that suggests is that a lot of the drying that occurred from the, uh, the pumice, I'm sorry, the club update came from turning off that additional diffusion. Um, and you can march all the way to the right, and we eventually end up at tag 132, which is the coupled evaluation 2 tag. Um, and so um, I did some runs with the coupled eval 2 tag, 132, called 132.rd, so revert diffusion. Uh, so I turn the club diffusion back on. And here I'm just looking at um, averages. Well, here's the total precipitable water field. Uh, with it off and then with it back on. And you can see that it's recovering the total precipitable water uh, that we lost when we went from 26 to 34. And it even moistens up regions like in the subtropics, such as like Hawaii. So this is an average over the Hawaii sector. This is the moisture uh, common water vapor bias relative to ERA5. So the gray line is 132, and we have this sort of dry layer in the dry shallow layer and a dry upper boundary layer. And so when we turn the diffusion back on and started moistening things back up, if you go down here, you can see the ZM mass fluxes here. These are the convective mass fluxes. So that additional moisten the boundary layer, increased cape and increase the ZM mass fluxes. One side effect of using this downgrading diffusion is it actually lowers the prognostic momentum fluxes. 
uh, because the down gradient diffusion sort of mixes up gradients, and so the product optic fluxes just aren't as active. Um, and then here's the diffusion coefficient that's actually applied. Um, you have the same story over the southwest Pacific region. So this is a deep cumulus region. So even in these deep cumulus regions, it's doing additional mixing. And they all overall, so they sort of conspire to bring back our moisture to more reasonable values. So we redid a new coupled run called 75. And it's right here. Um, and so 54 was right here. You can see the separation between the north and south. Uh, Virgin stones with this really nasty dry bias in there. So we've mostly gotten rid of it um, with just reverting this club diffusion back on. And it looks okay. Now there's something uh, that does not look okay, and it's been in our model since coupled to about one. And that is when you do um, it, there's this dry slot that you see in the central and east Pacific. Um, that you don't see in the observations. And to be clear, these are um, these are monthly standard deviations. So these are not climatological means, they're climatological standard deviations. And in the observations, you do see a little bit of a precipitation. You do see that drying, like the blues you see, but you don't see this sort of big convective band connecting the southern uh, convergence zone all the way to South America. You see like these little congestious things Maybe barely, but not this. And then over here is a CSM2's PI control. And you can see that it's, it doesn't exist in there. And I think they worked very hard to make sure that that wasn't in there. So we do have to um, still resolve this sort of dry slot bias um, as well. So, um, so this is where we're at now. Um, we revisited these problematic biases. And so we came up with the solution I just talked about now, which it just turns the club diffusion back on. And that's a couple of drones 75. And as Peter called said, this is, we're calling this the club L path, um, where L stands for the default L scale calculation for the Eddy length scale. And then we have a second path, which I'm not going to talk to about, but Ben's going to talk about, called the tau, Club Taus, where we turn on Taus. And basically, Taus is actually computing at a, an eddy time scale, and you use that to compute a eddy length scale. Uh, so it has a different way of computing L. Um, and so that's why they're labeled by what they're labeled. Both of these new pathways have the gust parameterization on, which Mike's going to talk about. Um, which helps improve the standard deviation of, of the SSTs of the West Pacific, for example. And then um, we're coming to an end of coupled evaluation two, and we're going to be moving on to coupled evaluation three, and they pretty much are just going to encompass things that Peter talked about that may still be coming in our GMP, new entry flux, you know, entry flux formulation, and potentially new gravity wave source uh, that Huli is going to talk about. So in the remaining minute or two, I just want to go a little bit further into 75. So there is technically some parameter changes, but not much. Only these top three I had to change to bring the top of the atmosphere into radiative balance. Um, and these bottom four kind of um, got put into CAM7 along the way for various reasons. Um, and you result, and, and so the blue curve is your 75 run. I put the average rest times over here. So we're averaging 0.06 watts per meter squared. It's just a hundred year run. Um, the cloud force, the short wave cloud forcing is looking decent, better than 54. Um, long wave cloud forcing has sort of always been something we struggled to get right along with short wave cloud forcing. If you try to get them both right, you can't bring the TOA into balance. And so this is um, sort of part of the course for uh, CSM2, CSM3. Um, and then the SSTs, I just want to emphasize that they're pretty cold um, and they're actually colder than CSM2. So this is a slide from Adam Phillips um, and he's showing CSM2 over here and then uh, 75 here, and then this is the difference plot. Uh, and so it's quite a bit warmer, uh, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. The second hemisphere, there's some cool, um, 
behaviors, but these things are also trending in time. And so I'm kind of need to take a deeper dive if you really want to understand these. I wanted to note that their uh, ocean model work group is still deciding what vertical coordinate they're going to use for their ocean model that does have uh, impacts on the SST field. So that's another thing to consider. So the um, the last slide I'm just going to show is it kind of uh, dovetails off of what Peter showed with the El Ninos that you have more realistic SST amplitudes. So these are composite El Ninos minus La Nino composites of SST and sea level pressure. This is CSM2. These are observations. And so you can see that um, the amplitudes were a little high in the SSTs. Down here is 75. Um, I'm sorry. This is 75 here, guys, in the middle. They're both the same. They're both around 75. Observations to the lower left. But nonetheless, you can see the SST amplitudes are more similar. Um, and the amplitudes are less than CSM2. And the teleconnections, the sea level pressures are a little weaker in magnitude than CSM2. They're still kind of in the right place, um, sort of right under that gully neck of uh, Alaska. And, um, but yeah, the amplitudes are reduced, which you would expect as the SSTs are reduced. That's uh, all I have for you guys. Um, so um, I guess we'll take time and yeah. Cool. Questions. The deep convection is particularly important in the tropics because to maintain the uh, reasonable profile of equivalent potential temperature. Do you think you got enough deep convection in the tropics? It would be worth looking for that. And I would look at the profile of equivalent potential temperature, which is the sum of the dry and moist uh, energy. But like it's it's functionally related to Cape. Mm -hmm. oh, we could talk about I have a paper on this you may want to see. I think that there's an understanding that our convection is not deep enough. In fact, uh, Jack and I, you know, we'll be looking at this thing. And and I, I agree with you entirely. So on Wednesday, if you want to see my club enough talk, I'll give you an, an opportunity to see how we can make convection go deeper. Well, I can have an idea. I don't in the dry slot. Do you see that in anemic runs or is it really a coupled issue? Um, it, it, it doesn't. It looks like it's a coupled issue. And so I think the SST changes underneath are playing a significant role. Dr. Dad, yeah. sort of, despite overall, we were colder in CSM2, we were sort of warmer right where we're sort of getting that extra South Pacific convergence zone. So I think uh, that is going to be a, a big part of it, but uh, the AMIP runs don't. Um, I've ran AMIP and it just doesn't show up as much. And can you go back to your the dry slot? I don't. I this, yeah. I mean, you're, you're pointing out the. Wait, is, yeah. Have you in the East Pacific there in that box for the convection of you? Do you know that it's um, deep convection versus club or whether it's because it can be quite sh it, it's deep convection often in those regions, but it's shallow. So it's like a congestus can often result. And I'm wondering whether. Well, I think maybe even the mean would be better to look at and try to uh, gauge the depth. I mean, you know, the Clearly, they don't look very deep, and if they are deep, they're happening, happening infrequently. Um, and so you may have a point that this may, even though these are reds here, this variability may indeed just be kind of these shallow congestus, um, which is which you, you want a little bit of it, but we're clearly overdoing it. Um, I haven't looked into what's the cause of this. This is an opening gambit. Yeah, it's quite concerning that all the way across Southern Pacific there, that it's much wetter than it was in CSM2. Not great. Thank you. Right. On that note, <laughs> I think Adam introduced uh, Ben's talk pretty well. Did 
going to talk about the other track we're looking at. So we have 12L scale, and it's going to talk about the clock of tiles. Things down at the bottom. Oh, down at the bottom is this product. I think I think I've been a project scientist here for the last couple of years. Seems like I've done that pretty fast. Um, this title may be a little ambitious. I'm mostly going to talk about B cases here, so not, not so much him uh, itself, but more C C S and experiments in the second half of the talk. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about uh, two different ways in which club can handle uh, dissipation terms um, and uh, what we see when we apply these different methods in, in uh, mostly B cases. I do want to start by saying that um, the Taos code that I'm going to be talking about is due to Zheng Guo, who wrote a 2021 paper on this uh, with Ben Slarson and some other people at UWF. And it was implemented in E3SM in that paper. Uh, so we're we've been trying to kind of get it into uh, CAM. Um, so as has been mentioned a few times by Peter and Adam, uh, there's going to be an improved version of bug flowing into CAM7. Uh, the main improvement is prognostic momentum flux uh, equations, replacing an old uh, down gradient scheme. Uh, over the last few months, though, we've been looking at the possibility of updating uh, the way that club handles dissipation terms. So the, the sort of way we've been doing this up to now, we call the club L formulation. Uh, club calculates a sort of master length scale that it uses uh, to calculate all of its, um, well, really just one dissipation time scale. Um, and then that version of the model includes this extra eddy diffusivity that I haven't mentioned. Uh, and then the tau scheme uh, basically calculates the dissipation time scales directly sort of for each individual term and I'll, I'll talk more about this um okay so club has a number of uh, higher order prognostic uh, equations and each of them contains at least one sometimes more than one a term that depends on a um a time scale so i'm just showcasing here the momentum flux equation that's coming into the model essentially this is essentially it and it has uh, one of these terms in it, and they always have a factor of one over tau in them. Uh, but in the CL formulation, what we've been using up to now, uh, that tau, uh, well, first of all, there's a tunable parameter in the numerator, so you can you could set that at the beginning of your run, whatever you think you want it to be. And then tau is calculated um, by means of first calculating this uh, master length scale, L, which has a different value at each vertical level. And then we divide that by a profile of, by the uh, square root of the TK uh, profile. Uh, so some of the things we'd like to improve about this method of, of handling these terms is it's non-local and it's a little bit more expensive because you have to you have to consider the entire vertical column in order to calculate the length scale at each level. Uh, it's also based only on buoyancy, which doesn't incorporate shear, for example. And because every one of these dissipation terms in club uses the same one over tau profile, it's less flexible. I mean, really, all you can do is scale this one profile uh, for all these different terms, uh, regardless of what physics you know, is going on. Um, in the tau's code, uh, what we do essentially is we take that c over tau term or, or factor and we replace it with a, what I'm calling a one over tau prime. And this is now a sum of different uh, one over tau terms. So in this case, there's a um, well. Um, you can point. Yeah, you can do that. There's a uh, one over tau uh, in, uh, no n, which is not dependent on the Brunvisela frequency, and then there's a one over tau n, which is dependent on uh, Brunvisela. The one over tau no n, it, you know, is, is a uh, sum of different terms. There's a constant background term, there's a shear term based on derivative of horizontal lens, and there's a surface term based on u star, which basically just falls off as one over c or height as you go up the column. 
Um, so that's this first term. And then uh, there's a one over tau n term, which is essentially just the run by slope profile, although it's cut off by a heavy side uh, function here near the surface, as we already have the surface term. And just to kind of illustrate that, um, I have these uh, profiles here on the right. Uh, so you can see you know, the idea is you have, you have the constant background term. The yellow one is the shear term. The green one is the surface term that's falling off as one over z as you go up. And then the red line is the front of isola frequency. And so you can use these to construct uh, an, uh, like a one over tau profile for one of your one of your dissipation terms. And depending on how you want to weight these different lines, and there could be other lines too, this is just a simple example, uh, you can build up a different kind of um, profile for one over tau. So this is local and cheaper because you don't have to consider the full column anymore. Uh, you can you can easily incorporate shear. And in theory, we would expect that it would be more flexible because you have these all these different terms that you're summing together with their own individual weights and things. Um, and just as a practical example, I wanted to give this uh, plot from Jimbo's paper, which is what you're seeing here are two LAS profiles from the BOMEX case. Uh, basically heat flux on the left and then the variance of, of um, theta L on the right. And the, the, one of the points they're making in the paper is that we'd like to be able to uh, damp the um, fluxes here above uh, cloud top where they're essentially zero without having to also damp the uh, variance here where it's, it's remaining non-zero for another thousand meters or, or so of the, of the column. So this is the kind of thing we, you know, we, we'd like to be able to address maybe with the cross code. Um, okay, so, so where are we currently with uh, these two tracks? Um, yeah, I don't have time to go into too, too much detail. Um, I personally have mostly been uh, trying to improve some of these larger scale fields that we've been seeing uh, that we've been looking at in, in, in these coupled evaluations like uh, short of cloud forcing, long with rest on, things like that. Um, so basically, compared to where we started, I think we've definitely improved uh, the, um, the short of cloud forcing and the long with cloud forcing. We've been able to achieve a balanced uh, rest on in coupled experiments. Um, and, you know, depending on I mean, I, I guess I don't want to give the impression that this um, plot on the right is the best I've ever seen in like using the TAUS algorithm, but this is the most recent um, couple of tests that we did. So I thought I would show this one. So this one does have a, a higher uh, RMSE. I mean, in that cases, I've been able to get the number down closer to 10, but then, you know, you might have a larger rest time or, or something like that. Uh, so it's kind of a challenge but we've made progress but i guess the, the long story short is that we're not quite we're not matching or beating the, the club l code yet so there's a couple of things that we'd like to understand better um one has to do with the way that uh convective activity works um so uh plots in the middle there are basically it's a uh, W prime Q, which is a third moment of vertical velocity. That's directly related to the skewness. Uh, so the skewness of vertical velocity, if you have a large skewness, we would expect that to be associated more with a um, cumulus layer, a uh, small skewness with a stratocumulus type layer. And what we're seeing here is basically, we're, we're looking all on this transect from roughly the Hawaii over to the DICOMS region. And um, when we plot WP3 along that transect, uh, with height on the vertical axis. Um, these top two panels show that the club L uh, code has a pretty nice WP3 profile near the surface, which is sort of what we're used to seeing in a region, you know, for example, like Hawaii, where we expect more of the shallow cumulus type profile. Uh, but when we turn on TAUs, we see different behavior here. Uh, we see larger WP3 um, near the Tycoms region where we, where it seems like it's too large. And then it's really just dying as we move out into the central Pacific. Um, and we don't 
really understand exactly why this is happening. It's it's quite persistent in the TAUS code. Um, different parameter settings, F cases versus V cases, even tweaks to the actual code itself. We still seem to get this you know basic kind of behavior. So we're trying to understand why. Um, it could be that we're, I mean, one, that, well, there is some evidence that this is kind of like a strong ZM solution where uh, John McFarland is doing more of the of the work here. If you look at that plot on the right, which is one that um, Adam Harrington uh, created, which you kind of already saw in the last talk. Uh, if you compare the gray and the red lines, that's basically Club L versus Club Taz. And so we're getting more uh, mass flux uh, from the ZM scheme in the Taz code. So, but yeah, we, this is something we'd like to understand. We don't, we don't fully understand it yet. A couple of last brief things. Um, we do have some questions about stability in the in in Taos. Uh, this is, this hasn't been like a huge problem. I mean, we've been able to run plenty of tests that have gone for many years or decades, up to eighty years, without um, issues, without stability problems. But it does seem like we have stability issues more in the task code than in, than in Club L's or Club L uh, tests. And uh, so that's something we'd like to understand better. Um, and then just very briefly, I thought I would just mention again what has already been mentioned by a few people, which is that uh, Adam Phillips here was kind enough to look at some of our latest uh, long tests with these two, um, two code bases. And he had some summary points that I basically quoted here about uh, ENSO and the longer term patterns that we see, which I personally cannot really comment on. But um, yeah, that's kind of an overview of, of where we are currently with uh, Club L versus Club Tennis. Question. A very naive question, but are the number of tunable parameters between the L scale and Taos the same, or are there more or less? There's a couple more. Um, we we would uh, like to take all of those original C parameters, the ones that I showed you in the first equation, C6 here. There's a handful of those, and we'd like to just set them to one, effectively take them out of the picture. And then, you know, we have these new tunable parameters. In the Taos code, uh, sort of a sheer background, you know, things like that. Uh, so we're in, in a way we're kind of trading one set for another, but there are a few more in the new set. Uh, uh, I, I, um, am on the Git thread that you guys discussed this on. So I saw recently you did have some tunings where you were able to get W prime cube increasing as you move towards Hawaii. Is it um, too preliminary to comment on that? Um, because it seemed promising from what I saw. Uh, yeah, so what I was referring to is we've done a number of, of experiments. Um, this is this is sort of in, in collaboration with uh, Jim Glow and Mitz Larson at UWM. We're kind of working on an automated tuning method where you carry out a bunch of experiments and uh, increase and decrease a lot of parameters one at a time, and you kind of look at the sensitivities and things. One of them did show some promise. Yeah, it, it, it did have a better WP3 profile across the Pacific there. But it also was like extremely bright. I mean, the, the, the stratus decks like extended way out into the Pacific. And I think the global mean was something like minus 55 or something like that. So it was just way too bright. Although we have talked about increasing gamma because as you, I think, as you know, we are using, we have been using a relatively small value of gamma in these runs. So increasing that might help to kind of destroy some of that cloudiness. Um, so far, <laughs> it hasn't really panned out the way that I would have hoped, so I haven't shown anything about that. No. Oh, did you have a question? I, I just had a quick question, but uh, have you tried, um, I mean, back to that WP3 thing, um, that was a, uh, this is a run with the current flow belt, so it has the additional diffusion? Uh, I believe. Actually, no, that's not true. I think I, I looked at um, Adam's RD test where you turned the diffusion back on. Is that right? Yeah, you would have to actually turn it back on in order to run it with tags after 059. 
And I will say it does look the, the, the WPP profiles do look fainter. It, it's sort of like this, although mm -hmm. kind of it's still a little bit shifted toward Hawaii. So you're still seeing a little bit stronger WPP on the Hawaii side of the, of the, of the, of the transect. But it is dimmer though. When you so that also kind the, of indicates yeah. that maybe. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Sorry. it's dimmer when you turn on the additional diffusion. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So it almost kind of starts to look a little bit more like the tennis one. Ready for preventing? We're going to have to wait, change. Everybody adopted in the bottle. Thank you. 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 Okay. So as Peter mentioned, as been mentioned in a lot of previous talks so far today, what I'm going to talk about is efforts that we've done to parameterize convective labor driven surface wind gusts in the community earth system model, which is work that I've primarily done with Rich Neal and Dave Lawrence, but there's a number of people who have contributed to this at this point. So just to make sure we're all on the same page about what I mean when I say convectively driven wind gusts, this is a pretty simple figure from Middlesburg at all in 2000. I think nicely illustrates what we're thinking about. Essentially, when you have deep convection, you can wind up initiating a lot of updrafts and downdrafts. When the downdrafts at the surface, they tend to spread out, you can form a cold pool, but on the leading edges, you'll have a gust front. And so those gusts ultimately wind up enhancing near surface wind turbulence, so wind stress. And that feeds into things like surface fluxes. So latent heat flux and sensible heat flux depend in part on the wind stress that's present near the surface. So even though what's happening with deep convection primarily is happening in the atmosphere, it can have important impacts on surface fluxes as well. So our question is, how can we actually capture that, the impacts of these convective outflows on surface meteorology? So I thought I'd step back a bit and think about how this parameterization was actually developed. And I started with observations, as other parameterizations do. So during Toga Core, there were a number of observations taken of convective storm systems. And this is one system that was observed during the period by Chipotle et al. in 1996. And I've highlighted in these green rectangles two different precipitation events. So at the bottom, you see the time series of rainfall. At the top, you see the time series of wind speed. So there's some kind of connection here where you, as you have a rain event, you see increases in near surface wind speeds. You will see a drop in temperature, and that's kind of a result of that um, cold pool spreading. So this is expanded upon. So originally, to believe all 96 came up with a few observations that are shown in squares here. Uh, the empty squares are observations taken aboard um, the, our, uh, the Moana wave during that campaign, and then the filled squares are different cloud resolving model simulations that they ran. This is expanded on in 2000 by Railsberger et al, who ran a number of additional cloud resolving model simulations to look at two full weeks and a small line during the total core period. And what they found was this nice relationship that's shown in the figure on the right, whereas rainfall increases, their measurement of wind gusts increases as well. And you can kind of describe it by this logarithmic relationship, which makes it fairly straightforward to put into a climate model. And so they proposed a method for that, which essentially is described here, where your gustiness wind speed is described by a logarithmic function for wind rates that are less than six centimeters per day. And then once you hit kind of stronger rain rates of greater than or equal to six centimeters per day, you would essentially just apply 3.2 meters per second gust speed uh, where the function levels off. Now I do want to just add a quick note, um, thanks to Adam Harrington and some discussion with Sean Santos, we are implementing this a little bit differently. So the Reynoldsberger et al. implementation was essentially looking at the squared um, sum of the large scale wind speed U naught and the gustiness wind speed UG. The way we're implementing it right now, we're actually not squaring those quantities. Um, the initial results that are also in EPSM that I'll discuss briefly also didn't have the square. So this is somewhat consistent with previous studies, but something we should look into more. So when we implement this in our system models, essentially it goes into the coupler in the way that I'm looking at it. So it applies only over ocean where those surface atmosphere fluxes are being computed. So your U10 essentially becomes the sum of your large scale winds that are diagnosed as usual, and then this gustiness wind speed. So observations from Toga Core and high resolution modeling have basically given us this parameterization that links convective wind speed to um, convective precipitation. So how do our system models actually respond? This was first added to E3SM a few years ago, back in 2018 by Harrop et al. And I won't go through all the results, but ultimately what they found was that when you add in gustiness, you improve the precipitation representation in A3SM over the tropical West Pacific in June, July, and August. But to kind of walk through how this all plays out, I thought I'd show you the results from CESM, because that's what our primary interest is here. 
So I've done a series of simulations. These are AMIP simulations for a control simulation that does not have the gustiness being added on and a gust simulation that does. These are AMIP with historical forcing from 96 to 2014, 50 year vertical levels, cam depth physics. And what I'm showing you here are the 10 meter winds in the control and the convective rain rate in the control as well for boreal winter DJF. So what you'll notice is that throughout a lot of the tropics, we have pretty weak wind speeds on average. So this is U10 contoured where it's less than six meters per second. So fairly weak. And then overlaid again on the precipitation panel as well. So these regions with light wind speeds are also regions that tend to have a lot of convective precipitation. You can imagine that the mean wind is not necessarily um, capturing that. When we add in gustiness on the bottom, we're looking at just that gust addition. So the wind speed of U gust and then the total change in 10 meter wind from gust to control on the bottom right. So as expected, where we're adding gusts where we see those darker oranges and reds in the bottom panel, those tend to be where we have high convective rain rate, low mean wind speeds. And that feeds into our total 10 meter wind. 10 meter wind is important because it's used to calculate surface fluxes. So CSM, the largest responses we're seeing are in the tropics, but they're actually mostly in DJF rather than JJA. Um, the regional responses can also differ quite a bit, which I want to dig into a little bit here. So we'll start with the Indian Ocean. So just to remind everyone of the last slide, this is a region that has a strong addition from UGUST and where the total change in U10 is actually fairly strong, so about one meters per second. One of the things that happens when we add in gusts is that we actually improve our biases. So here we're looking at the latent heat flux bias on the left-hand side relative to air fiber analysis and uh, precipitation biases on the right-hand side. So within the tropical Indian Ocean during DJF, there tends to be a dry bias. So it's really clear here in latent heat flux, which is being underestimated in the precipitation biases. What actually tends to happen is you see an overestimate in the western part of the basin and a dry, bi a dry bias in the central and eastern parts. Now, when we add in gustiness, we tend to mitigate those. So here we're looking at the change in the total magnitude of the bias. So if the magnitude of the bias in gust would increase, that's a purple, that's good news. There's a lot of purple in these plots, which is encouraging. So in the latent heat flux bias, we've seen that we reduce that dry bias quite a bit. And um, that's not a small amount, certainly. And then in the precipitation bias, we also reduce the dry bias that's happening in a lot of the basin. Part of the thing that's happening that I think is interesting is we also see a bit of a decrease in the wet bias in the uh, western part of the basin. So I don't have a plot showing it here, but essentially in the control, what happens is that a lot of the precipitation in the Indian Ocean is falling over the western part of the basin. It's concentrated there. And when you add in the gustiness, you're actually allowing precipitation to occur throughout a wider portion of the basin. So that's contributing to some of these biases we're seeing here. So in the Indian Ocean, we enhance U10 when we add in the gustiness that enhances your latent heat flux because you're enhancing the wind stress. That reduces the dry bias. That also actually enhances your vertical motion. So we're enhancing the walker cell a bit, which I didn't get to show you. And that drives more rainfall. So again, we're reducing a dry bias and rainfall. Now in the West Pacific, something else interesting happens. So I want to touch on that briefly because it's not necessarily the same story. So the West Pacific actually doesn't show much of a change. So in these mean plots where I'm looking at the gustiness that's being added and the change in U10 for the West Pacific, I mean, it's interesting, but it's not, it doesn't stand out here, right? There's not a lot of red in this plot, but this is a case that has evolving SSTs. So we're averaging over different phases of El Nino. And as I'll show you in a second, that actually matters. So the results that we're getting, if you're averaging over every phase of Enzo, doesn't look super exciting, but the response changes depending on phase. So here we're looking at 10 meter winds in the control case on top for all DJF months, for just months that classify as being in an El Nino phase, and those that classify as being in a La Nina phase. So even in the control simulation, you can see some differences in kind of the background wind speeds as expected, whether you're in an El Nino or a La Nina, or just kind of an average over everything. Now the change that we see is also really interesting. So this is the delta 10 meter wind between gust and control. So again, in all months average together, not a lot looks like it's interesting, but the El Nino and the La Nina differences are pretty distinct. So over the eastern part of the region that I'm looking at here in the West Pacific, in El Nino, you get pretty large increases in 10 meter wind speeds. Those drive increases in latent heat flux, changes in precipitation. In La Nina, you actually see a decrease in that region. So in some cases, you're offsetting that change if you're averaging over everything together. And similarly, what's happening here in the southern part of the region of interest as well. So in the West Pacific, it's not necessarily that we see this mean state change, but there are differences depending on which ENSO phase you're looking at. So there are, the ENSO phase drives unique flux and rain responses as a result, which I haven't shown here, but um, you can kind of infer from the 10 meter wind changes. One last note I want to point to is that results in fully coupled development simulations that have been done as part of the Camp 7 development work 
suggests that not only does ENSO play a role in the impact of the guest that we see, but the guest actually seems to be playing a role in how strong ENSO is, as other talks have alluded to. So here are a few plots from Rich Neal looking at observational estimates of uh, El Nino strength here on the left-hand side, and then a recent pre-industrial control number 54 on the uh, right-hand side. So Adam mentioned this before, it was kind of one of the earlier um, coupled baselines that we were looking at. And you can kind of tell just by eye that the coupled simulation from number 54 has much stronger El Nino than we see in observations. And when you add in guestiness, so here I've replaced our observational panel with guestiness, things are looking a lot better. So just taking 54 and adding in that gust parameterization to the near surface winds actually reduces the amplitude of El Nino in a positive way. So just to summarize what we've talked about and what I've shown today, observations and high resolution modeling really underpin the development of this parameterization. Um, it's been implemented in, CS in EPRSM and the response has been um, kind of confirmed here in CESM. The largest responses in the tropics during DJF but those regional responses can differ, especially by phase of El Nino. And results point to impacts of the guestness on El Nino as well. And we're still kind of working to understand exactly what's driving that, the weaker ENSO and the gust simulations. I think there's also an open question right now, what is the impact of change in the way UG is added? So that's something to look into. And then again, this is something right now that only applies to ocean surface fluxes. So it's not being applied over land. Um, how exactly we should do that, I think, is also something worth digging into. So I think there's enough encouraging signs at this point that this should go into Camp 7, um, all things, assuming no crazy things happen. Um, fingers crossed. But yeah, with that, I will take any questions. Thanks. Question. I love it. So this also goes into the wind stress calculation over the ocean? It goes into the calculation of U10, which I think was okay. Yeah. yeah. And so then that would then feed back maybe onto 10 meter wind climatologies. Have you compared those? Yeah. So that's a good point. It, so when I look at like the 10 meter wind difference, it's not necessarily just an easy sum of like U0 from the control plus UG. So yeah, there are kind of some feedback effects that, that happen there. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And, uh, does it get better or have you looked? Not really. Um, when I looked at the U10 biases versus Air5, they actually looked a little bit worse when you add in the guest years. The latent heat, fly, the latent heat flux biases look a lot better. So it's kind of unclear why that would be. Yeah. Does this affect the wind profile at higher levels, like the steering level wind? Or You know, I haven't looked at that in a lot of depth. Yeah, I think that I don't have a great answer for that. I will say that there's definitely changes in the walker circulation more generally. And so I would imagine that there's maybe some effects that are carrying up into the vertical. But yeah, we should check. All right. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Dave. Let's move higher up in the atmosphere. <laughs> move some mountains. Can I save it somewhere? No, no, it's there. It's near the bottom. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. The warrior is briefly returning from the pool. Talk. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm going to be, as Peter mentioned, moving further up into the uh, further up in the atmosphere. Uh, before I get started, I want to uh, you know, call.
I'll call out my collaborators here at NCAR who have contributed to many aspects of what I'm doing. And I really want to highlight uh, uh, Joan and Martina Bramberger at Cora, who really have spurred spurred this uh, this work on, and uh, are uh, hopefully going to help <laughs> with the final implementation if what I talk about here is uh, is adopted in the model. Um, this is a simple talk. Uh, uh, it's all very. Uh, I'd say very raw. These these results really are literally from the last couple of weeks. Uh, so uh, the first thing uh, I'm going to do is just talk about stratospheric wind biases in the current version of the model and how they have uh, uh, changed uh, since Wacom 6. So uh, I'm going to show uh, the first bit of this talk is going to focus on comparing Wacom 6 FW his run. So these have uh, full chemistry. So you have to keep that in mind. There's not really, these are not completely apples to apples. I think the differences between what we're seeing now in the model and what was in Wacom 6 aren't really, you can't really explain them uh, uh, by the inclusion of interactive chemistry. But the, I, I just want to alert you that that is, that is a, uh, one of, a difference. So uh, what I'm showing, what I'll be showing as Wacom 6 is the CMIP 6 contribution from Wacom. Uh, and thanks to uh, Doug Kinnison for that. Um, these runs use the FV DICOR, uh, our old vertical, uh, vertical resolution, the vertical structure. Uh, so that's uh, 1200 meter uh, resolution in the UTLS and a top at 150 kilometers. I'm gonna compare that with uh, with a recent version of our model. So it's not, it, it's more recent, uh, it's it's TAG 139. So uh, it's very close to what uh, Nick Pettitella talked to earlier this, earlier today. Um, this model now uses the SE uh, FizzGrid DICOR, which uh, Peter talked about. And it's not full chemistry, it's using our new sort of it's equivalent to the Wacom specified chemistry configuration. We're calling it prognostic greenhouse gases because it affects uh, CO2 and other other greenhouse gases and allows those to interact with radiation, although they're specified at the surface. Um, and then finally, I'll I'll just show some tests of a new uh, a new GW a new gravity wave source uh, that are uh, put into this FMT hist uh, control run. All right, so let's just, you know, dive in. Uh, these are zonal, all, all I'll be showing today are mapped or plots of zonal mean, zonal wind, uh, seasonally average. So this shows the, you know, the solstice uh, seasons, DJF and JJA. Um, and on this side here, on the left, is the Wacom 6. Here is the new model, and here is ERA 5 for comparison. So what you see is uh, things have gotten a bit worse in, in our current model. Uh, our stratospheric, uh, our polar night jet in the southern hemisphere is a bit worse than it used to be. You know that you could say, well, that's compensated for a little bit by slight improvement in the northern hemisphere. And so I'll just point out that uh, whereas the, the new model is slightly worse, neither the new model nor nor uh, Wacom 6 uh, get this sort of tilt in the in the southern hemisphere polar night jet. And that's something that uh, Many many models struggle with, and it's something that I don't think uh, uh, has ever been correctly captured in 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 Wacom. Moving to the transition seasons, uh, you know, let's just ignore NAM for now. So we'll focus on September, October, November. That's the springtime in the southern hemisphere, which is important for uh, 
or uh, stratospheric chemistry. Remember, wind biases are, you know, through thermal wind, wind biases are uh, uh, correspond to temperature biases. So if there's a positive wind bias in, in high latitudes in the southern hemisphere, it typically means you also have a cold bias. So what you see is that both WACM-6 and the new model are uh, weaker, uh, sorry, stronger. They have stronger, stronger zonal winds in SON than ERA. That means both of these models uh, likely have a cold bias in, in this uh, springtime transition. And, you know, once again, um, our new model, the 93 level uh, FMT, uh, is a little worse uh, than uh, WACM 6 was. Okay, and again, uh, they're both uh, they're both uh, they're both delayed uh, compared to the observations compared to ERA. All right, so uh, this this is a uh, this is really just a complete speculation, and I think after hearing uh, Nick's talk today, I think probably some more you know fine grain. I'm, you know, archaeology of our of our model is in order, but the things that have changed uh, between Wacom six and the model that I'm showing here, uh, you know, there is a change in the dicor, and there's a change in vertical resolution. So the change in uh, the change in dicor has two, uh, you know, has has two uh, consequences. FE is a more dissipative dicor than the speckle element dicor. But it also has high resolution, high latitudes at 60 degrees. You know, basically a one degree model is well, it, it, it has twice as much horizontal resolution in the zonal direction at 60 degrees as as uh, SE, for example. Uh, it also has lower vertical resolution and uh, this might uh, might uh, is the uh, emphasis lead to more uh, wave driving by whatever is produced at the surface in Wacom 6. So these are uh, just speculations, as I said, so I don't want to dwell on them uh, too much longer. Uh, here are, you know, that we, uh, Simona and Rolando and several of, several of us have uh, done uh, a, lot of, a lot of testing with this new version of the model, trying to improve things. Uh, we've tried a lot of things and uh, I, I, you know, I don't have time to really go into the results uh, uh, in any depth, but I'll just try to summarize by saying that we have uh, tried tweaking your graphic scheme. We've tried strengthening uh, aspects of the frontal scheme. We've roughened topography. We've even introduced uh, horizontal spreading of tendencies uh, in the dicor, uh, you know, on, uh, with with the idea that. Uh, you know, there's this gap in the ocean, uh, there's this gap in the southern hemisphere where there is no topography uh, centered around 60 degrees. So maybe spreading tendencies laterally would help. Uh, the bottom line is that none of these things that we've tried has really made a substantial difference in our simulations. And uh, uh, that's particularly true for the breakup. Uh, it, uh, none of these changes made uh, a dent in the late breakup of the vortex. And none of these uh, none of these uh, tweaks or uh, tuning attempts have had have had any impact on this uh, uh, tilt of the uh, southern polar night jet. So uh, we're kind of led to uh, uh, this this question: uh, Do we need another gravity wave source that does something in the southern hemisphere? Uh, so here are uh, the three current sources in the model. There's mountains. That's obvious. They have, you know, they're 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 uh, uh, fixed. So the phase speed of the waves launched by topography is zero. Uh, the problem with mountain waves is they really give you kind of limited leverage in the southern hemisphere because, well, as we all know, uh, there's less. Uh, there's less land in the southern hemisphere than in the northern hemisphere. There's two other sources, deep convection uh, and fronts. Both of these sources uh, launch uh, 
a broad spectrum of waves so that, you know, if you strengthen these, if you strengthen either of these sources, you not only get, you not only get waves with small phase speeds, you get waves with large phase speeds in either direction. And these high phase speed waves will be dragging the atmosphere towards, towards their, towards their phase speeds. So playing with these two sources uh, can lead you, can get, can get you into trouble because there's this sort of maybe unintended consequence of strengthening high phase speed waves when it seems pretty obvious, uh, maybe only obvious to people who look at gravity wave uh, parameterizations a lot, that what we need here are slow phase speed waves to reduce, you know, to bring the jets down. So, um, Martina and Joan have been uh, working on this new scheme, which I'm going to start calling the Magic Mountain Scheme instead of the Moving Mountain Scheme. Um, it's a possible uh, missing missing source, and I think it's easy to understand. You, know, you have convective motions, either deep or shallow, but you know these updrafts can displace air vertically, and so that's the basic idea. You have these updrafts in the boundary layer or in the ITCZ. And as they move along, they they cause you know they cause ripples in the atmosphere. You see these things all the time if you look you know look out at clouds. You see these little caps uh, over over uh, over thunderheads and things like that. That's uh, th those are signatures of these things. So this is you know we uh, Martina and Joan are working on a more kind of rigorous implementation of the source. But for let's say for for giggles, we we introduced a very simple version of this in which we we basically have three parameters: a steering level, that's how fast the cloud or the thing is moving, the launch level, that is where the you know the obstacle effect takes place, and you know there's we have to assign a momentum to us. That's what you know. That's the strength or the amplitude of the waves coming out of these things, and as a very first attempt. We simply take uh, the momentum flux uh, given by club's new prognostic momentum flux parameterization, and we just multiply it by an arbitrary parameter. You know, uh, we assume that maybe a percent of this momentum flux is leaking out of the boundary layer in the form of these gravity waves. And this is an average in the boundary layer, more or less. So three, three things. And, you know, what you see is initially it's a it's a very promising uh, promising result. This over here is our current control without the new source. In the middle is the uh, the model with the new source included, and over here again is ERA five. And you know what what we see that's very promising in this uh, uh, in this simulation is that we get. Uh, a really substantial improvement in in southern hemisphere winter. We get you know uh, a big reduction in the winds. We also start to see this you know this elusive tilt of the polar night jet. So I you know this is a really promising promising thing. And on top of it all, it happens without doing any any damage so to speak, in the in the northern hemisphere. So this new source is giving us exactly what we want. Uh, we kind of, you know, we sort of knew this was going to might be what it does. But, you know, it's giving us a lot more drag in the southern hemisphere and really not much more drag in the northern hemisphere. And that's that's good so far. Um, and you see that, you know, this is just to bring bring it back to Wacom 6. That that our, our new simulation is, in addition to being an improvement over our control run, it's also an improvement over over the Wacom six simulation from uh, CMIG six. Unfortunately, you know, uh, not every we can't always, you know, things always have good sides and bad sides. Well, it's not bad. Uh, it's still an improvement over the control run. So this is SON the springtime in the southern hemisphere and in fact we have done a you know this new scheme has substantially reduced 
uh, the wind speeds in the southern hemisphere during the transition, during the springtime transition, still not as, for some reason, uh, it's still not as good as Wacom 6 was. So the immediate thought is, well, we have three things we can play with, so we'll, we'll start to tweak. And the first test that we've done with, well, we've done lots of tuning tests, but I'm just going to show one here. Uh, and that test is very simple. We simply multiply sort of the, the vertically leaking momentum flux from plug. Uh, instead of 1%, we now allow 5% to emanate from the boundary layer. And, you know, that has, again, it, it does good things and bad things. So here is the first attempt, SOM at the top, and, you know, it's strong with five times the momentum flux coming from uh, from the boundary layer, we now get really good agreement with uh, ERA in September, October, November. But now we have, you know, we've gone too far and now the Southern Hemisphere vortex has really kind of, well, you, you can see it's, 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 it's gotten, it, 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 it's gotten um, pretty, pretty distorted compared to what it was uh, in our in our previous test. So, you know, if we could somehow figure out a way to increase the source during the transition season without doing it in the in in the you know in in, in during during the, the height of winter, uh, we 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 have something you know we have something pretty good. Even as it is, I think you know this is still. It's still an improvement over over the model without this source at all. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and summarize. As I said, this is you know this is really a very new uh, a new set of results. Um, the basic summary is that this moving mountain source with you know let's call it a very simplified version of the moving mountain source shows that I think there's promise in in some sort of some sort of uh, effective obstacle source like this in um, improving wind wind biases in in our model. Uh, I think the source the source here is very simple and I think we still need we still need to work on the source and uh, Martina will talk more about some of some of what we're thinking tomorrow. Uh, and there's a big caveat here. Uh, we have tried, you know, we've tried looking at this in a nudging configuration where we nudge winds to ERA. And uh, unfortunately, what we were hoping is that we'd see, you know, great correspondence between where the nudging tendencies are very big and where this new scheme produces very big drag. Unfortunately, that's not what we're seeing. So, you know, I think it's this is telling us we, we, I think we need to think about this a little more. Uh, I'm not sure whether our interpretation of the nudging tendencies, maybe, I'm hoping that it's just that we're interpreting these too naively, but maybe not. Maybe it's just telling us that the source needs uh, needs some, some changing. Okay, so that, that's the summary and the caveat. Uh, future work, uh, Martina. Uh, Martina and and, our, and I, I hope to I hope to help in some way. We'll you know we'll start looking at uh, uh, comparing this new source with uh, data from stratospheric balloons that can directly measure momentum flux. So you know here we won't have either you know the uncertainty or the excuse of not knowing how to interpret nudging tendencies when we when we see results from this analysis. And I'll close by just showing. Really confusing result. Uh, I, I'm just throwing it up there uh, for your consideration. This is a result from uh, Adam and Renee Wingard's new uh, dual polar grid with quarter degree resolution uh, at high latitudes in both hemispheres. Um, this is just, uh, it's the same configuration as what I've been showing before, except now the horizontal grid's a little different. 
And what we see is, yeah, I mean, here is the result from the uh, from this polar uh, dual polar grid. It's it, it's it's really kind of promising. Uh, and I I have to confess, I I don't understand. This is you know, it's not like we're going to three kilometers here. We're going to twenty five kilometers uh, in this sort of uh, more darkly stippled region in both hemispheres. So somehow. Even going to you know that somewhat higher resolution has made the model behave quite a bit better. And I, you know, I, I'm not showing SON, but SON is also substantially improved in this dual polar configuration, which I'll, you know is quite a bit more expensive than than the global one degree. So anyway, that's 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 all I uh, all I have today. And uh, be sure to uh, come to Martinez talk tomorrow. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Simona. Yeah. So nice. Um, quick question: When you did the two different simulations, did the breakup time change um, because the second attempt that screwed up the other part, uh, the uh, I, I, June, July, August, but did it do better in the breakup? I'm assuming it did because the SON looks so much better, but I haven't. But you haven't I haven't done the line plot yet. yet. Yeah. yeah. Just about the two hypotheses, I guess, with all the vertical resolution ones, this didn't really change in that the just with the resolution alone, of like the polar vortex breakdown. Um, is, is that, that a, a, it, are, are you is that what you found, or are you yeah. asking? Okay, all right. So you think it's not it's not increasing vertical resolution that has made the model sort of less in less less viscous? I don't think so. I think they're okay. pretty similar. <laughs> okay. I think, uh, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Uh, had, a, had his hand up. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, Julio. Thank you, especially for the last slide with enhancement of horizontal resolution. So we made uh, several years ago a FFGFS simulation from 100 to 12.5 kilometer resolution. And we got exactly improvement of the tilt of the, of the of a stratos stratospheric jet in the in the southern hemisphere winter so my 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 hunch is basically the missing horizontal uh, divergence of uh, mesoscale gravity wave fluxes this is definitely and even uh, simple analytical can can show that considering only vertical divergence is not enough because horizontal divergence is comparable with vertical divergence. You the know, horizontal divergence of horizontal sub subgrid, subgrid, okay. subgrid momentum fluxes. And when you enhance horizontal resolution, you start with off mesoscale gravity waves and then improve basically due to yeah. this stratospheric jet. Right. Just wondering functionally how you apply this. I mean, you got your little cartoon here, and I'm wondering, do you say if there's convection, does it have to be convection? No. Oh, it, just it, it just had it condensation? No, no. Oh, okay. All, so all I do, because uh, this isn't, you know, uh, all I do is look at the agnostic club momentum flux. Oh, that's it. Okay. Yep, that's all. It's okay. very simple. No, uh, the two, the two levels are fixed, and the amplitude is determined by the prognostic club momentum flux, and it operates everywhere all the time. Are you just doing the steering level? Did you just say? I just. <laughs> it just seemed like a reasonable steering level for you know we we want low phase speeds yeah. so it's you know we're stacking the deck so are you, are you planning to try and change that or? uh yeah i, I we're, we're i mean we've been doing tuning you know we've been doing sensitivity studies to all the parameters uh the steering level does have small impacts on the answer but nothing I, I raise the steering level to about you know, level five above the surface, and it changes things a bit, but not much. It really seems the momentum flux is the most important. Okay. Just a comment. If you want to get ozone right in the southern hemisphere, September's your month. Yeah. And so you would, November, we don't care so much about. Right. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I. I'll, I'll 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 do the uh, kind of more careful analysis and 
I'm, I'm assuming that September is looking much better with this than it did before, but it's just an assumption. So I have a question. So from the results you showed, do you think the shadow convection is also very important to source of gravity wave to driven many general circulation in the stratosphere? The gravity wave generated by the shadow convection. Well, uh, I'm, I, I, I think it is. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure at what scale, you know, is it sort of an envelope of lots of shallow convective events that's causing the wave? I, I think it is. I mean, I think the, the improvement in that in that uh, uh, June, July, August jet, you know, uh, we can't get we can't get it any other way except, you know, by increasing resolution. So I, I think it is. I think it is an important source. And I think it might have impacts in other places besides, uh, you know, high latitudes. Uh, one thing that we're hoping is that this will have impacts on QBO behavior. Maybe even, you know, it might even affect momentum exchange in the tropics. But I, I do think it's right now. I'm fairly optimistic that this is a real, a real thing. All right, thank you, Julio. And last but not least, uh, Brian Madero is going to give us an update on the uh, code base for regulation. He possibly couldn't be in person. He's not feeling too well, but he still agreed to give the presentation remotely. So I hope the guys up there will take over. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Brian. Great. Can you see my slide? Yes. All right. All right. Well, thanks for the flexibility letting me present from home while I get over this cold. Um, hopefully, I'll be in later this week. It's going, be, it's going to be a pretty simple presentation. It's an update on the presentation I gave last year on the implementation of RRTMGP in CAM. So that's a new radiation parameterization. Most of what I'm most of the work that's happened in the past year is really due to Brian Eaton and Jian Sun, um, Brian Eaton working part time with the soft with the CAM software engineers and Jian Sun and Sizzle, and a lot of the work has been Brian cleaning up the code that I handed off to him, fixing a lot of bugs and iterating back and forth with the RRTMGP develop developers on a couple of small issues. So just to remind you, this is um, almost exactly what I showed last year. RRTMGP was for a relatively short name for this scheme, I'll call it RRTMGP, is a rewrite of RRTMG in a more uh, modern Fortran 2003 standard, but it's still underneath the hood, it's still a plain parallel correlated K two stream radio transfer model. Um, the, the big change is that it really uses um, classes to control the information passing within, within, the, within the scheme uh, and across pieces of it and separates things to be more modular and flexible. There's no assumption of vertical ordering, so we don't have to flip arrays when they go into the radiation anymore. That saves us a little bit of work. And um, the spectroscopy that the radiative transfer is, is uh, using is updated significantly from the very old version of RRTMG that we've been using for a long time. Um, so that's a, that's a bonus. That means that our, our calculations will be more accurate the short wave solver and the long wave solver are simple functions uh, where you give the optical properties. That's this vector k that are that are in these um, these expressions here, and then the, for the short wave you need the insulation and the surface albedos, and for the long wave solver you need the Planck sources and the surface emissivity, and then the fluxes come out of that, and then we turn those fluxes into into heating rates. The one, some of the nice things about moving to uh, this updated code base is that we're going to get GPU capability um, basically out of the box, although Jian Sun has done significant work to, to make this work in the CAM configuration uh, as part of the Earthworks project. And there is a CCPP version of RRTMGP already in existence. I'm not sure if it's up to date with the current version of RRTMGP, but I think at least it'll give us something to start from when we when we go to CCPPIs, the radiation. Essentially, what we're doing is bringing in RRT 
RTE or TMGP as an external code base, just like we bring in many of the other parameterizations. Um, and we're writing a new interface between CAM and that radiation scheme. It's replacing radiation.f90, for those of you who have looked into that. So it's a module um, that provides that interface. And a few supporting changes, our TMGP inputs um, basically replaces our, our TMG state and rad constants has been updated. Um, those are pretty minor changes um, in the grand scheme of things. The current status is that we're using um, version 1.7 of the radiation scheme, which was released in November, and this uh, 1.8 of this RRTMGP data, which is actually the coefficients that go into the scheme that provide that we use um, with the lookup tables that are inside of RTE. Um, that was also released on, in November. Uh, the PR is in process. I saw that there were comments on it this morning. We're at the level now of fixing um, grammatical errors in comment strings. So I think we're pretty close to being done. We can you can turn on once this once you have this branch from Brian Eaton or the new ver the new cam tag that this that um, where this will be incorporated, you'll do an XML change with a uh, cam config ops to turn the radiation to our TMGP to turn that on. And I think that that's the only change the user will need to make at this point. Cosp should be available um, from the beginning. And uh, just to for this presentation, I did a couple of very short test simulations uh, for the um, with Brian Eaton's uh, sandbox, which is what's being used for the PR. So it should be a very recent version of CAM. And I did an FLT hist and an FMT hist um, configuration from 99 to 2006 and from 96 to 2002, basically copying recent runs that Cecile had in the AMWG development repository. Uh, this is the interface structure. I'm gonna skip this. Um, it just shows you the, the few subroutines in each of the modules, it doesn't matter. Um, but this is the, the flow through the radiation tend um, subroutine, which is the main place where we do calculations to get the radiative fluxes. Essentially, this is we just do some data preparation at the beginning to determine whether we're going to run radiation, update cloud fractions to include snow and grapple if we need to, go into the shortwave scheme, set the cloud properties, the gas properties, scale the solar source, set the aerosol optical properties, and then we do the clear sky flux calculation by running with the aerosol and the gas optics. <laughs> then we just increment the optics with the clouds to do the all sky fluxes. So it's just two two uh, calls to the same scheme to do the clear sky and all sky fluxes. And then we do some output. Same thing for the long wave where we, we do the cloud properties, set the gases, set the sources, up aerosols, and then do the clear sky and all sky fluxes. And then everything gets cleaned up and turned into, into the radiative heating as the output. So these are some results from these two runs that I did. Um, and let me, did I tell you what, what these runs look like? No, I will. I'll come back to some details of these runs in a moment when I talk about performance. But this is really the the left is um, L58, so FL FLT hist. Oh no, these are all FLT hist. Top row is the short wave cloud forcing. Bottom row is the long wave cloud forcing. The global averages are shown in the titles. You can see that there's a slight change. The differences are shown on the right. So there's a one and a half watts per square meter difference in the shortwave cloud forcing. If you look at that plot a little bit carefully, you'll see that it seems like a lot of that, a lot of changes are happening in regions of um, low cloud cover, low level cloud cover. So it seems likely that we'll need to do some retuning uh, when we move to RRTMGP. Uh, the long wave cloud forcing seems relatively unaffected, which is nice. The next one is, this is just the same thing, but now with the FMT configuration, so the, the higher top um, configuration. And I should mention that RRTMGP and RRTMG both stop doing anything at about one hectopascal or so. So above that, other processes take over. Um, so this is just a, a sanity check that we're not breaking anything. And indeed, we get almost the exact same result as with the, the lower top, about one and a half watts per square meter difference in the shortwave cloud forcing. This is just the net flux at the top of the atmosphere for these, these four runs. Um, so the gray lines are the control runs with RRTMG, L58, and L93. And the, the orange and red lines are the RRTMGP versions. 
I think the important thing here is that they track these two different runs, track each other relatively well. They're not diverging significantly and they're staying close to each other. Just indicating that the RRTMGP mostly looks like a drop-in replacement for RRTMG uh, and um, modulo those changes in the shortwave cloud forcing that will require some retuning. These are the heating rates for the FLT hist, the low top version. Um, yeah, this is the shortwave heating rate in Kelvin per day. You can see that the vertical structure looks very similar between RRTMG on the left and RRTMGP in the middle. The differences are pretty small, but not not completely negligible, um, which I guess makes sense when we when we consider the shortwave cloud forcing changes I showed you a second ago. Same thing for the long wave here. Um, these are very similar to each other, but they um, there are some funny things happening the low levels in the difference plot that I don't understand yet. And I'm wondering if they have something to do with surface conditions, but I haven't looked into this in any great detail yet. In terms of performance, uh, I was actually quite worried because Robert Pincus, the developer of RRTMGP, had warned me that we were going to get a slowdown because of the RRTMGP um, the new code base. But in fact, what we see is on the on the top row, a comparison of the L58 runs, which were two year runs on 2160 processors, and the lower the lower yellow um, row, the L93 run, which was six month runs with the same number of processors. And we don't see much difference at all. Um, that we do spend quite a bit more time in radiation, but the overall impact on the simulation is about one or two percent uh, in terms of P hours per simulated year, which I thought was pretty encouraging and is pretty small compared to other things we've done to the model recently. So just to wrap up, uh, our RRTMGP will be available as an option shortly in a CAM tag. In the default configuration, there's a slight performance penalty, but it's actually pretty slight. I don't think it should be um, something to worry about at this point. The results with these um, FL and FMT hist comp sets show fairly modest differences. Um, maybe a couple of things to look into, like that that heating rate at the in the lowest level at the in the long wave. But it does look like there will be some retuning required what, because of that short wave difference. Our RTMGP already works on GPU and it's being adopted by the Earthworks project, and they're starting to work to optimize it. Um, right now, it's not any faster than running the CPU version, but I think that will change shortly. And there is that CCPPI's version uh, that we can use going forward. Uh, at least it uses a template. And we do get some additional benefits by going to this new code base, which is things like people are working to optimize the radiative um, transfer calculations, for example, uh, replacing the lookup tables and the interpolation that is used now with uh, machine learning models and just a couple of examples shown here that are already published. And then the other thing is the spectroscopy, which I mentioned earlier, is significantly updated from the old version of the radiation. So even without anything else, our clear sky radiative transfer is much more accurate than it was before. So that's it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Brian, for giving the presentation, even though you're feeling under the weather. Are there any questions for Brian? For the sake of asking one, you looked at um, just the kind of long term mean uh, response. And I'm wondering whether you've looked at a higher frequency or something to say whether certain kind of regimes might have a big difference between these two, super cold in the Arctic or something, I'm wondering. I haven't looked at this in the in the last few months. Um, before last year's AMWG, we had done some, um, some scam experiments to do just that, and the RRTMG and RRTMGP versions looked very similar for the regimes that we had looked at at that time, which were I think just uh, tropical deep convection and shallow cumulus kind of regimes. I, I don't think we looked at any high latitude regimes. All righty. Oh, one more. Jesse. Oh, Brian, this might be a question for Johnson. Do you know 
has he done has he done the GPU experience only with like the Earthworks code or has he done it with Ham code? And do you know is there any gain to running our TMGP on GPUs in Cam? I is John here? No. I think that he has done testing in Cam using Brian Eaton's tag or branch. And I think, but I don't know if that's where they've tested the efficiency between GPU and CPU in terms of performance. I have to check with him. I, I can contact him too. I was just curious if you knew. Okay. Thanks. That concludes um, overview from the AMWG of everything going into CAM7 or being uh, considered for CAM7. Uh, and as I mentioned, we would like to conclude this couple evaluation two exercise by making a choice on club in the, in the not too distant uh, future. Uh, if you would like to be part of those conversations or you're just excited about model development or an analyzing output of these runs we have a meeting called the camp 7 meeting on fridays at 10 a.m it's a very informal meeting in fact the slide deck is, is not done until like 9 59 people are still throwing in slides uh, but it's a really great venue to, to discuss uh, model development and, and the analysis of our runs or if you want to provide input for the decision we're going to be taking in the not too distant future. Tomorrow morning, we're going to hear from the other working groups as what's new going into CESM3, so from the, the chemistry and high top modeling group. Um, it looks like everybody's ready to, <laughs> to conclude. So let's thank all the speakers. And, uh, so. Thank you.